Good afternoon and welcome to the members of the listening and viewing public, the media, and to the officials of the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services and the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. My name is Bridget Anizet George and I'm the chairman of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. The Committee on Public Administration and Appropriations, PAAC, has the mandate to consider and report to the House on A, the budgetary expenditure of government agencies to ensure that expenditure is embarked upon in accordance with parliamentary approval. B, the budgetary expenditure of government agencies as it occurs and to keep Parliament informed of how the budget allocation is being implemented, and C, the administration of government agencies to determine hindrances to their efficiency and to make recommendations to the government for improvement of public administration. The purpose of this meeting is to conduct an inquiry into the provision of flood relief grants by the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. The role of the committee is to assist the stakeholders in achieving the efficient delivery of services while ensuring that the expenditure is embarked upon in accordance with parliamentary approval. To determine the challenges being faced and possible solutions to these challenges and to make recommendations for improvement of public administration. The meeting is being held in public and is being broadcast live on the Parliament's Channel 11 and Radio 105.5 FM and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Parl View. Viewers and listeners can send their comments related to today's topic via email, parl101 at ttparliament.org, facebook.com slash ttparliament, and Twitter at TT Parliament. At this time, I would now call upon members of the committee to introduce themselves, starting from my extreme right. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, all. Simon de Norbrega, member. Good afternoon. I am Randall Mitchell, member. Good afternoon. My name is Wade Mark, member. Good afternoon, Lacra Bodo, vice chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ayana Webster-Roy, member. Good afternoon, everyone. Lauren Sislop, member. Good afternoon, everyone. Lisa Morris Julian, member. Thank you. And therefore, can I now call upon the representatives of the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services and the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government to introduce themselves. And therefore, I will ask the Deputy PS of the Social Development and Family Services Ministry to lead off by introducing herself and her team and then followed by the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Ryan Ramtran, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Wendy Guy Hernandez, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Good afternoon, everybody. Jennifer Harvey Better, Acting Director of Finance and Accounts, Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Patricia DeLeon Henry, National Director, National Social Development Program, Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Ron Francis, Head of Investigations and Compliance, Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Christine John Guy, Acting Director of Social Welfare in the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Yes. Good afternoon, members. Uh, Peter Mitchell, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jerry David. I'm the Senior Disaster Management Coordinator at the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. Thank you very much. And to note that the committee is ably assisted today by Ms. Hema Bagalu, its Assistant Secretary, Ms. Keisha Peterkin, the Assistant Secretary, and Ms. Rachel Nunes, the Research Assistant. I therefore now call upon the Permanent Secretary, well, I, I don't know which one, which one of the D, DPSs in, um, thank you very much, Mr. Ramchan has volunteered. I therefore call on uh, Deputy PS Ramchan from the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services to make a brief opening statement if he so wishes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The Ministry of Social Development and Family Services is mandated with the responsibility for addressing the social challenges of poverty, social inequality, and social exclusion. As a result, the Ministry places particular emphasis on developing and executing programs and services to protect and assist those who are classified as vulnerable and marginalized groups, such as persons with disabilities, the elderly, the poor and injured, indigent, socially displaced persons, families and persons living with HIV AIDS, as well as youths at risk in terms of those affected by disaster. As the core social sector ministry, it also spearheads the coordination and implementation of several government initiatives for achieving sustainable human and social development and adopts a dynamic, service-driven, and client-oriented approach. To this end, the Ministry continues through its divisions and units, and in partnership with key first responders, such as the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, and re regional corporations, to strategically facilitate an integrated approach for its social protection, flood relief measures. This combined approach, where when uh, effect, effected allows for seamless timely assess, assessments and the provision of a full suite of services uh, as well as psycho, uh, psychosocial support services uh, in terms of the various verification procedures. The ministry remains committed to leaving no one behind while maintaining its fiduciary responsibility in the context of good governance. It is in this context that the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services welcomes the opportunity to meet and discuss with this committee the very important issues related to this service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramchan. And therefore, I will invite uh, Mr. Mitchell, the Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, to make a brief opening statement if he so wishes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, along with our colleagues from Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, to participate in this meeting. Madam Chairman, members, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government functions as the coordinating agency which guides municipal corporations, special purpose enterprises under its purview in assisting communities by pooling resources in targeted areas, which include, among others, infrastructure development, disaster management, public health, and sanitation. The Ministry is committed to facilitating, coordinating, monitoring, and ensuring the accountability of municipal corporations in the effective and efficient delivery of quality services through mean meaningful decentralized systems, structures, procedures, practices, and the provision of specialized support services. In the area of disaster management, our disaster management unit is mandated to facilitate and maintain a robust disaster risk reduction cap capability at the local government level through the provision of expert disaster risk reduction advice to the administration of the municipal corporations, as well as to collaborate with other first responders in providing local level assistance to citizens impacted by disasters. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think I would like to start off this conversation by addressing this to Mr. Mitchell, certainly to give us some context in terms of the role of your ministry in the issue of flood, flood relief. Um, in the submission, we had seen that uh, you play a role in uh, certainly assessing 
um, the damage and losses to households affected by flooding. And uh, we were told that uh, it's a collaboration between your ministry and the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Could you outline uh, for us and the viewing public the role of exactly what is the role of your ministry when it comes to this collaborative process? What is your role? And also, if you could give us some uh, clarification on this tool called uh, ARCGIS Survey 123 system. Thank you. Okay, I will open the batting order and my colleague um, will handle the rest. Basically, uh, Madam Chair, members, when a disaster happens, whether it's flooding um, or bushfires or any sort of natural disaster, once it is okay by the experts for persons to go in, the Ministry of Rural Development collaborates with the relevant regional corporation where the disaster takes place in sending in officers to assess the initial damage. Uh, each regional corporation has two field officers. However, depending on the severity of the disaster, as I said in my opening statement, the Ministry will coordinate with other regional corporations to supplement personnel to go in, and of course, we have the municipal police service under our charge, and they will go in and assist in the assessment process. In some cases, the Ministry of Social Development will be with us in the beginning, but as I alluded to earlier, as soon as it is okay for personnel to get into, when the hot zone is declared safe for personnel to go in, we actually go in. And I'll ask um, Mr. David to continue there, and then he will explain the, the system that is used to the assessment. Jerry. Madam Chairman and uh, members, uh, for a long time we had been using paper to, uh, to do what is called damage assessment and needs analysis. That's uh, DANA as we call it. What we are attempting to do when we get into a hot zone is to see what are the immediate needs of the victims. So not so much at that point to do the assessment. The first thing we want to do is to see whether or not we need to rescue people to save life and limb, first thing. Now, we will then proceed to do the, the needs analysis. Now, we can only do the needs analysis when the water has gone, has subsided. Sometimes we go into areas and um, like in the Bamboo area in, 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 in at the end of the year, where we had six feet of water, five feet of water, we could not see anything under that water. So we had to wait until the water subsides. Now, we also had to go in and do some rescuing, taking people out of the water and carrying them to a safer location. So as soon as we got in to do the... Uh, the assessments, as because the water has subsided, we, are, we, we, we can actually treat with people now. Uh, we would use an, app, an application that was developed by Sedema, and uh, we were trained by it during the pandemic. Many of the field officers and volunteers were trained in how we, we would actually uh, fill out this survey one, two, three. It's, a, it's an app is on the ArcGIS platform. We can actually do the application from your phone. We can do it on an app, uh, on, a, on a tablet, sorry. We can do it on a tablet. It doesn't matter if you have data or you have Wi-Fi. Once we go in the area, we can actually collect all the information. We can take pictures, it gives you uh, uh, a geopositioning of every single house in the, that has been impacted once we do the, 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 the survey. It, um, it presents a dashboard. We can see, for instance, if it's Mayaro, Rio Claro, we can see on it uh, if assessments were done in Sangue Grande, in Tunapuna Piaco. By just a touch of a button, 
we can actually know street, um, the, the hazard that impacted. It's so complete. At the end of it, we can even pull up a, uh, um, an Excel version of everything. The thing about ArcGIS is that not only the assessors on the field can see it, the folks at the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, they can see it almost real time. As soon as we get back to a place, if you don't have Wi-Fi and you don't have uh, a data, as soon as you get back to a zone uh, where there's Wi-Fi and data, it automatically uploads. And if we need social development to see it, they see in everything, pictures, they see in um, the location, they, they are seeing the narrative we're writing, they are seeing all the data we're inputting. Now, that is a far cry from the, uh, from the paper that we used before. And uh, it also allows less people trying to fool the system. So that, that is what we have been using. Uh, and we started using that in April of 2021. Uh, we have many people well trained in it now. Uh, other agencies are asking for us to put, put them on it. And I must say that uh, the ODPM, they were part of it too. I must give them that credit. They, they actually had the app, um, developed the app through working through Sedema and they, they did all the teaching of our uh, field officers on it. Uh, assessments are, are, are things that we are used to at the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. That's what we do. We know what to look for. We know all the areas that are being impacted long before, long before the rains hit there. We know where it's going to get hit because the history shows that if rain is falling in Pinal Deve, we know that every street will get hit. We could take a phone, Madam Chairman, and call a person and say, are you okay? Because we know they're going to be impacted. And throughout Trinidad, the DMU knows exactly who is going to be hit. So when we go in, we, just, we, we are taking the data, we are taking pictures. And uh, you see the fact that we take pics now is so important. It takes away from writing that long narrative of what we see. That's critical. And uh, in terms of people's IDs, another thing. We, take, we are actually taking a pic of the IDs back and front. So you cannot say that, um, and, and, and we're, we're moving to the point, Madam Chairman, where we are going to actually be giving them like a receipt, a copy of, the, of what we did. So they can't come and say, well, um, they, they, when we send it across to social development, they can't say that they didn't know or they did not agree to what was done because we are showing it to them and, they, and we actually take a pic of it, a screenshot, to their phones. Well, those who have the phones, and most people have the phones, folks, and even though there are a, a, a number of them who don't, um, we can always make a paper copy available to, 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 to them. So that's where we are now with assessments um, between the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. We are talking with uh, uh, the self help Commission now for they, so that they can use the same app and that they can uh, actually be a part of the whole thing now. Thank you very much. So I, I just want to ask then to, to social development in terms of the, uh, uh, from what Mr. David and Mr. Mitchell have described, it, it appears to me that the, the reliance of this app, one, will help for data collection and also provides a, a mechanism for verification. Um, and, and from what Mr. David has said, it feeds to you directly. So I, I would like to ask you all, how the, has that impacted uh, your processes in, um, in assessing grants for flood relief victims and reaching these victims? How has that impacted your processes? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The ministry, in terms of a, 
uh, an integrated approach and truly use of technology such as the one we're discussing, um, as indicated, provides the ministry with vital information, uh, the geo reference information as well as the pictures that support the process of evaluation. Those processes, and I will ask uh, the director NSDP to speak to sp some of the specific processes, but in terms of an overview, those processes are then streamlined or to be able to, to check for, in terms of the system, uh, persons who may have applied across different areas uh, in terms of the verification of that person, and not just the individual who may be applying on behalf of the household, but if there are several persons within the same household who may be applying. So information and that data is um, a vital part of the decision-making and response process to ensure that the, the applications received are in fact validated and validated through uh, the persons on the ground who may be visiting because we are collecting the data through uh, the Ministry of Rural Development, local government, um, to be able to, to process those applications and, and screen those in terms of priorities in some instances. So let me ask um, the director to speak a little more to the details of those processes in terms of how they've impacted where we are now versus where we were previously. Thank you. The, in terms of the processing, it has become a lot easier, I would say, because we are able to download the forms. We are able to download a database from the ArcGIS. So for example, I can put in information related to the particular period of flooding, and I'm able to download the entire database and therefore download the subsequent applications. We are also able to prioritize persons, persons who are in immediate need of assistance. We are able to pull their application and process it. If there's any missing information, we are able to send out our verifiers, contact the client if we can't contact them. We send out our verifiers on the field and we obtain the rest of the information that we require to complete the processing. Thank you. So let me ask this. So it, it, it means even though you get this information ahead or, or almost real time from the Ministry of Rural Development and Local okay. Government, you still have to await an actual application by a, a, a victim for want of another word to begin a process. No, Madam Chair. What we use is the, the actual DANA form that the Survey 123 creates. We are utilizing that as the application. Oh, so that's the basis of your application. Yes. Okay, now, in, in your speaking, and I, I wasn't sure if it's just a manner of speaking or if it's, if, if it's my oversensitivity to words, but in terms of, you, you said once the information is entered correctly and completely, so I'm looking at the word completely in terms of is there a, a synchronization of the 
information that you require for processing a grant and the information that the Ministry of Rural and De Development and Local Government may be interested in uh, when they go in there as the first responders. Is, is there some sort of um, standardization of information so that once they do their thing, the information is sufficient for you to begin your process? Uh, Madam Chair, as part of the process, the form in question is the basis by which the system was created, the DINA form. So that form really uh, provides the basis by which data is collected. Mm -hmm. However, in some instances where certain fields may have not been compulsory, and if information is not necessarily available from that particular person at the time, um, the application is still made. However, it may require some additional information. So give me a for example. So for example, in terms of one I can think about that I've seen is uh, the pictures may need, you may need additional pictures. The, the, the pictures were taken, maybe the angle, some of the details, etc., and uh, some other associated information. But I can say, Chair, that both our ministries continue to collaborate with a view to strengthening the process based on the experiences over the last period, which will include some of the things being highlighted, such as the basis of the data and even the additional training, which we had discussed recently in terms of the users of the system to be able to be a bit more attuned to the specifics of those requirements. Okay. Thank so you. So might I ask, when is the ad additional training planned for if it has already taken place? So there, there was some discussion, and I'll defer to our colleagues to determine a date. I don't think we a date was just spoken to just yet. Um, um, uh, Chair, if I could just interject, yeah. Um, training in disaster management is a continuous process because, as you would understand, um, we are now getting into the realm where climate change is impacting on actual resilience. So we have to be always on the ball with that. So um, training is a continuous exercise in this, in this manner, and all our disaster management coordinators in the regional corporations are involved and so forth. Um, I can't say if any have been happening for this fiscal so far, because, but I know that this has been something that is ongoing. And CDMA is a very good um, partner with us in terms of making sure that we are ahead of all of the technologies. And the only limit to us utilizing the technology would be resources, mostly financial resources. Some of it is donated, of course. Uh, USAID has helped, the Canadians have helped in the past, and so forth. So training is an ongoing process, and we also involve um, the, the ministries, particularly social development, as well as other first responding ministries. Yeah. And just as a side with, we also do training regularly through the Red Cross to our CERT teams, that's the Community Emergency Response Teams, which Mr. David coordinates from head office. Yeah, but so, you see, Mr. Mitchell, mm -hmm. uh, and I really commend the continuous training, but, um, I am more looking at the targeted issue as identified by the Ministry of Social um, Development and Family Services in terms of uh, a, 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 a more efficient use of the app to assist them so that the, the, the loopholes or maybe things, because we, we might all have a camera, but what I am looking at might not be what is of interest to you. And what I understand is there are certain gaps actually by the user, the user not identifying that, look, this angle might, it's not that I'm just trying to show the place damaged badly, but I need to show certain things that social development could use. So that the collaboration that you all speak of, I, I, I want to know if that is fed into the training. And, and, and that is the specific training I'm talking about. Exactly. When it's going to take place with the focus, it might be wide, yes, but feeding into the 
uh, issues that may affect the processes that social development have to undertake. Sure, I will ask um, Mr. David to go into that <laughs> focused part because he deals a lot with the field officers on the ground. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'm glad you asked that question. I think I expected you to ask that question. <laughs> um, we have been doing this with social development for one, two, three, four, four years so that their officer would go to regional corporations and we would talk about doing the DINA, damage assessment and needs analysis. The, uh, and where the challenges come up, and you're correct, is how does the assessor interpret what he is seeing and writing the narrative so that social development can easily pick up and say, well, yes, this is bona fide. Um, for, for example, you would write on the, in the narrative, four feet of water entered the home of Mr. So-and-so. It appears that the, 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 the washing machine, the fridge, the refrigerator, the furniture has been damaged. So we, we, we're saying that now, that's what we see. Now, when we're doing the needs analysis now, we have to now say, um, it appears that there is a need to replace the refrigerator because the compressor is um, after some effort has not started. Now that is doing the needs analysis. Each um, field officer has to go through that process. And uh, we talk all the time. We have been talking this with social development for more than four years. They will send the officers to the DMUs to train the officers. This is what we are looking for in order for us to do an assessment properly and give the grant. So, okay, so let me ask something, either to you or Ms. Henry. In 2022, I think that's the last flood we had, right? How many of the forms that were obtained from Survey 123 system, how many of them were inadequate, incomplete, or incorrect? And you don't have to give my exact number. You could give me a, 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 an ideal of a percentage. Because that will tell me how successful those four years of talks mm -hmm. have been. So, Ms. Henry, maybe you could tell me. Right. So the, forms, the forms helped you or they didn't? Right. So, yes, the forms were helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. But um, I would say approximately three out of every 10 forms. And the, what we recognized was that because they were using, in some instances, this was the first time that the officers may have been using the technology and using tablets or phones in terms of data entry and taking out the pictures. I think that that's where some of the challenge was. All right, now Mr. David and I, we have discussed and also I know at the level of the executive there has been discussions. So the plan is that we intend to pursue some joint training, and that will be, as far as I'm aware, in the near future. All right, we want to, however, complete the exercise that we are currently doing so that we have a comprehensive view of the areas that we need to address going forward. So the exercise you're curr currently doing is from November 2022? Yes. This is March? Okay, so I, I will, I'll leave the other members of the committee to go, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask, therefore, um, in terms of the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, has the introduction of Survey 123 system decreased your reliance on your critical incident portal? In terms, of the, well, in terms of the quantum of applications, the majority of applications, and I'll ask Ms. Uh, Henry just to uh, verify that, but my understanding is that the majority of applications are in the Survey 123 system. It's the primary solution used to reach those in need, and therefore um, it has been used as that primary tool to facilitate the processing of said applications. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, and Ms. Ms. Henry, may I ask you, have you been able to um, analyze or evaluate why you're still getting CIP applications? What we have determined is that when a disaster takes place, members of the public utilize any um, means that they can to submit information to the ministry. So they would have been assessed by the regional corporation. They would have gone to the ministry's website and also applied using the portal. They would have also visited the ministry's offices to give information that they were impacted. So that is the reason why we have persons utilizing the platform, because any anywhere that they can turn, they are going to to put in their information to ensure that their name is there for relief. So your analysis is that the instances of that is really where there is a, a duplication of effort. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll, I'll, at this stage, I will just open up to members of the committee and um, invite them into the conversation. I therefore call Dr. Bodo. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon again. Um, I just wanted to go back to the ARC GIS um, system just for clarification, and perhaps Mr. David could respond. So first of all, I'm, I'm very happy and very impressed that we have such a system operating out there. You know, from my own experience on the ground, you wouldn't think that the technology is there and being utilized, so I'm very happy to hear that. Um, and of course, it, the tremendous potential that comes with that. Um, the two things I wanted clarification, whether all the DMU staff, whenever they go out, um, have access to this application. And the second, um, you did mention that you're able to predict um, within the constraints of reality, of course, and, and, and so on, where the, where the flood will reach. So my question is whether this information is shared. I, I understand it's shared with the, the other state agencies. But is this information shared with, for example, those on the ground, like local government councillors or members of parliament who sometimes will have sleepless nights when the flood is hitting 10 miles up the road and one day next morning where, where it's going next? So, so the question would be whether there's any provision for sharing of this valuable information um, with those on the ground, such as the councillors and the members of parliament. Uh, member. Let me answer the question. The first one you asked about whether all of the assessors have their tablet, yes. Um, fortunately, the ODPM had provided us with one ta each municipal cooperation with one tablet, and then the ministry bought another one. We have two, two field officers, so they, so they are tablets. Many of the folks, um, the field officers, don't take the tablets because they find it, um, some of them have told me, I'm really not going in that area with those tablets. It's looking too big and looking too, you know. <laughs> but they use their phone. They can use their Android, and they can uh, perform the same functions. So that um, I could, if I give you, if I give you accreditation now, a member, on your phone, you could see everything that's happening in your municipal corporation. Once we, uh, uh, in your. In, yes, in, in your constituency, as long as once we input the information. So if it is, it is um, members of parliament requires um, that app on their phone. They can see it. You know, you can't do anything else but see it. Okay. <laughs> because we will only give you access <laughs> to see it. That's, that's plenty. I would love to see it. Yeah, and you would, you would actually see. And then you'll be able to actually, um, when we, if you require... Uh, Excel version of of every area by street, by people's surname, by people's age. You could do almost anything with it. Okay? For the other question you're asking about information to, to you, um, the ministry has started the, this Ministry of Rural Development and uh, Local Government, we started the Community Flood Early Warning System. You see, all you see on television there with all the um, with the dashboard showing, showing you what level all the rivers are at. That came from the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. Must take a little credit. Um, and, and I have to give credit to Water Resource Agency too. They, they, they help quite a bit. 
and the ODPM a little bit, but <laughs> but everybody tried. All right. Now, uh, if you wish to have that app and all, to, so you can be able to see on your phone where um, every single uh, water course that we have flood stream flow stations on right now. We have 13 that the ministry did. We had UNDP, uh, yes, give another eight. So you will find that when you see the next set of um, information from stream flow stations, it will not only be bamboo and south of approach. It's not be those anymore. You will have probably about 20, near 30 of them. So you can actually see most of the major rivers. In addition to that, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, again, what we're doing is that we're going to be putting cameras on all those stream flow stations this year. So that what, so, and, um, and you can actually go online on our, web, on our website, and thanks to um, UNDP for that one, and you can actually see, you'll be able to see, and not only the stream flow stations and, and the level of the water, but you were able to have cameras, a camera view. Uh, in bamboo, we couldn't see in some areas. We plan to fix that. So even though we don't have stream flow station, we must have eyes that we can see now. And uh, our minister, um, when he was speaking at, in parliament, the budget debate, he said that um, the ministry is, is working on putting in um, cameras but this year, it's 100. That's what we could afford this year, Madam, um, speak, ma Madam Chairman. <laughs> but um, we will work to get more so we can actually see what is happening. And um, all the apps we have, uh, member, we're happy to share it with the parliamentarians. Because it's your, I mean, these are your people, and we want you to be able to see. Thank you, sir, Madam Chair. I just want to indicate that I would be very interested in taking up Mr. David's um, offer. Not a problem. Well, yes. you, you know, we do make recommendations, so um, let, let's just don't get uh, beyond ourselves. <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, do you have any more questions at this stage? No, um, Member do, no, Abrika, do you want to join the conversation at this stage? Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to speak about the timeline for responses. And in, uh, in the submittal from Ministry of Social Development, I think it is, there is a, basically, a, a, you show the flow well, through all the steps, right? So page six, so we look at the process. Um, one of the, I think one of the things that, that you all would have submitted that this, this should take one month optimally and three months at the outside. I have to tell you as a member of parliament, this is not my experience, yeah? So what I, there are a few things I, I want to unpack. Firstly, um, we are talking about the DMUs being your, your first responder when, it, when that is the, the path by which the process takes. So the DMU goes in, assesses um, the entire process, right? What is the, my first question with regards to timeline is what is the, what is the, the time taken on average between the incident and the assessment by the DMU person, right? I'm, Mr. David, I'm using DMU as, through, through my experience at the Martin Regional Corporation. Um, so that is the first. That is the first issue. The second issue I'd like to find out about is, or just to get some feedback on, is if someone uses these multiple platforms to to register this incident. So they they use the the um, the ARC GIS system. They use the CIP system. Um, they go directly into social welfare. What is what is the process by which you all ensure that you don't have these multiple incidents being logged? Um, so how do you all weed that out? How is that done? What is it? Because that's not in here at all. 
this is some this is an assumption here that the person uses one platform makes the registration of the incident and you all move to the process but of course um, my my take on it is that it, this is done because there's a there's a lack of trust by the by by the person who's in who's in pressure that the system is going to work for them so they they go to every port in the storm right um, so that is the second that's the second question the third question is that we do have a real issue where you may have multiple heads of households in in an individual location one can each head of household make their own application and two does each application require its own assessment And again, how does that impact? So just in there alone, I am very concerned that three months at an outside is actually achievable because we, are, we have even gotten to the part of verification. We have even gotten to the part of processing. So if you could just walk me through that process to address the issues. Um, and then, well, yeah, I may have a couple others after that. Thank you, Member, and through the Chair, um, so the timeline is really a combination of two elements, and which I'll ask uh, both our Ministry as well as the Ministry of Local Government Rural Development to speak to, because you have the initial assessment, then you have the what might be considered back-end processing, the information comes to the Ministry, and then it's processed. So I'll ask um, Mr. Leon Henry to speak to that a bit. Just to touch on the issue of the systems and the multiple applications, again, Ms. Henry can speak to some detail here, but the ministry does carry out a process of deduplication where the names, ID card numbers, or, or ID, identification numbers are cross-referenced against each other as part of that deduplication process in, uh, implicitly within the, the processing. And uh, the issue of multiple head of household, which is a reality and does exist. Again, there is a process in place, and I'll ask Ms. DeLeon Henry to speak to that particular issue, but um, maybe you can have the first component in terms of the timeline with regards to the actual assessment on the ground, and then the back-end processes at the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Thank you. Uh, uh, member, again, I'm happy to, you know, I'm, I'm in my element here because <laughs> once the incident takes place, the DMU is activated immediately. As I said before, we track everything. We know if there's all this other rain is falling, I will call them. I will call the, the, the disaster coordinators. Um, how is it looking? If I, I'm calling Penal Devi, I'll call Vidish Lal. I'll say, Vidish, how is it looking? You say, plenty water. Water coming. And we ain't get it yet because it coming from, you know, it's coming from that Maruga end to come down. So we know we're planning to do the assessments there. All right? Once, once it, it, it is safe, and, and we, we sort of harp on safety quite a bit, you can't help a victim by becoming a victim yourself. So we want to go in as fast as we can. We finish assessments. We are good at it, our member. Once we go into our home, we know what we're looking for. If you're telling me that the washing machine got washed away, and I ask you what type of washing machine it is, and you say it's a, automatic, um, a dryer, it's an automatic dryer, all right? I say, well, where you plug it in? You know you have to have a special type of thing for 220 current for that one. So when they ask me for it, I say, well, show me the box where you have plug in the machine. They can't show it to me. And we have eyes for everything we see. We look at the walls. If the level of water of the wall is one foot off of the ground, you, you, you don't tell me that you lost everything. You may have lost some things, but don't, you, you understand what I'm saying? So we have the eyes for all of that. And we do the assessments, and as soon as we do it, and as soon as we reach, if we, are, if we have data, if we have, if we have um, Wi-Fi, social development sees it one time, immediately. If we go back to the office where we have the Wi-Fi, then social development would see it. So they have access to it. Remember, we are trying to do two things at the same time. 
do an assessment, and we're trying to bring relief to these people. Remember, many of them would have lost all their mattresses. They lost this. I mean, we have to bring in um, hampers to help. We have some, some of them, we have to take them out of homes to carry them to safer locations. If, if at all, take them to shelters. Trinidadians don't like to go to shelters. Sorry about that, but we, we set up shelters and people don't like to go to it. But we still have to set the shelters up, move people out, and then we go in. And then we're doing the assessment now so that social development can do their, uh, um, their thing with the grants. So it will take us, the floods in um, Bamboo, it took us like two weeks. And that is because I brought all the other field officers from all the areas that were not impacted. And there are two field officers in Tunapuna Piaco. But we can put that burden on two of them. But I remember, there are 14 corporations. So I moved all the field officers from all the other corporations. And we were there Saturday, Sunday, holidays. It didn't matter. We don't worry about what time of day it is. We're just going because we, we, we trained, we are trained that way at DMU. And we go in and do all these assessments. So to answer your, um, 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 answer your question, uh, a member, we could, as long as the daylight, <laughs> we're there. <laughs> and sometimes into the night. Once we could see, we're there. And um, the information is uploaded immediately to social development. They have access to it. Well, let me put it this way. They have access to it, and then they can make their determinations. Member, just to continue what uh, Mr. David had said, uh, one thing when he said it is important that uh, the committee understands that the moment an incident happens, we have to be assured that it's safe for our people to go in right after. And I, I know that is something that people who are suffering may not want to hear. They want immediate relief. But it's important for us as the ministry executive that our staff is safe to go in to do those things. Secondly, we are improving our communications capability, as Mr. David outlined to the honorable member in terms of the cameras we're putting in, but in terms of our communication with all our DMUs so that we can mobilize them and move them across the country quickly. And also the municipal police. We can't forget the municipal police because they have been a very good backup, in terms, particularly with the incident in November and so forth, so that once we can get bodies on the ground, from moving from incident to assessment, we, we try our best to make that timeline as short as possible. But safety is important, and two, we are working in terms of coordinating with the other uh, regional corporations so that when, if they are not affected, we can mobilize their resources to back up, uh, in this case, Tunapuna Piaco, which was a test case. So from that, we can look at that, from that experience, and we can improve on that going forward. Thank you, and I'll ask uh, the director, NSDP, to speak to some of the back-end processes based on the questions raised. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about duplication. So we are working with the ArcGIS Survey 123, and as I indicated before, we have the access to the system. We will download an Excel spreadsheet which forms the database of the persons who are affected. We also have our critical incident portal. Now, the critical incident portal, if somebody walks into the ministry and indicates that uh, they were a flood victim and they want to apply using the critical incident portal, the staff of the ministry would assist them in putting the application on the system. So let's look at the survey one, two, three first. At the ministry, we have a duplication, a deduplication exercise with respect to that data first. Because there will be instances where someone can be assessed by different assessors and it ends up on the system. So we actually eliminate that in the first instance. That's the first one. The second thing is with respect to the critical incident portal, we are cross-referencing the ArcGIS with the critical incident and we are eliminating duplication across the two systems. So at this point in time, we have had instances where persons applied on the ArcGIS and the critical incident, and we have identified, because as I said, 
the primary system that we're using is the ArcGIS, the Survey 123. So we have identified it and we have removed the duplication. So they would only receive one set of relief. In terms of the household, I know that that is a touch, a pain point. And I want to take a moment to clarify that whole household debacle. So it starts at the level of the assessor, right? The assessor is gonna ask certain questions of the particular applicant and try to ascertain what is the living circumstances. Because in Trinidad and Tobago, we have some unique living situations. And as us working in social development, we have to take the time to determine, well, what exactly is happening in this particular house? if there is a single household residing here or if there are multiple households. And we are able to do that. If it is we are uncertain, we have our field officers who will go back out. And we have had instances where we determined that it was in fact two households and an additional assessment needed to be done. Now yes, an additional assessment would need to be done because of the fact the assessment is forming, works as the application. So therefore, I would need an application for the head of this particular household and I would need another application for the head of the other household so that we can provide relief appropriately. All right, and in particular, this is quite important because as it relates to furniture, if there is shared furniture, then with the household items grant, I will use that example. We have to determine from discussing with the two households, well, all right, the furniture belong to me. Uh, we were just sharing the furniture, so that's how we know who we are able to give the grant to. Chair, just, just one more. Um, DPS Mitchell, you and Mr. David both raise an issue um, that you do have shared resources. So whereas you have, you have the um, your assessors, you have the municipal police. But how is the timeline impacted if you have a national incident? So if you have multiple regions that have been impacted, um, how do how do you how do you cope with that? I'll, I'll just answer that briefly, Mr. David. Uh, that's what we call the perfect storm, because you're talking about a national disaster. So I'm thinking at the level of a hurricane that passes us. Um, we will do, yeah, yeah. Um, what we do, um, as I said, our, our disaster management unit coordinates with other first responders so that, for example, if, if a regional corporation is overwhelmed and our resources from other corporations cannot make it, we try to use like the defense force and we call in other um, first responders that can help in that case. So it is something that is a risk factor that we have acknowledged and we will be doing some, hopefully, tabletop exercise as we go along to deal with that. But I'll ask Mr. David to comment further on that. But it is a, something that is a concern to us. Um, member and um, Madam Chair, uh, I have always advocated, whenever I've come before committees, community emergency response teams. The communities must learn to recognize, respond, and recover for themselves. Because for the first 72 hours, we have to prepare that nobody is coming. So that's why. And um, the last time I came before a committee, we were at about 2,300, I think. Um, we, we are going past 3,500 third volunteers throughout the country. When we did the training with Sidema, third volunteers were part of that. So even though it was a Sidema program, we have third volunteers who have been certified to do um, ArcGIS Survey 123. We have been training people for the community flood early warning system. They are community hydrological observers. Again, we are training the, um, the third volunteers. Currently, we have third volunteers in Maloney in the swimming pool. We're teaching them how to search and rescue particularly in Tunapuna. We went into some seriously high waters, and after that, I told the, 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 the team leader in Tunapuna, we have to train people to swim. 
So we have the first cohort of 20 persons. If you go on um, the ministry's website, you will see them actually in the waters with their, um, with their life jackets. We did it in Mayara Rio Claro, where we were training people against cert volunteers, because it is in the communities that people um, have to learn to help themselves. If the bridge is washed away and no professional first responder could get to a community, it has to be the community itself that has to be able to, um, to respond and, and, and help itself. So that, um, yes, member, uh, um, um, and my, my MP, <laughs> I, we, have <laughs> we have done a lot of cert training, and they are the ones who are helping us now. They were on the field. So, um, I, 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 while I am so grateful for all the uh, discussion with respect to the actual um, sort of dealing with the, with the disaster. Um, I really want to sort of focus us on the, on the relief. And you know, some of the questions were really intended to see how does um, the, the, what you do, Mr. David, how does that assist um, the Ministry of Social Development in giving them a, a, a sort of um, push forward in their their process of getting the relief. You made the point. Um, important thing is to get relief to the people. So um, at this stage, um, I don't know if M Member Hislop would like to join the conversation, and um, let's really look at, at, at the sort of relief that, that, that people are likely to get and how that is administered and so on. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, afternoon again, everyone. We're talking about the GIS, the, the survey, and, and the question I have to ask is how, if, if we have this online system, if I'm not mistaken, and you could, you could correct me if I'm wrong, how do we still face duplications? How do we, isn't, isn't there a way or isn't, isn't it built into the system that if, okay, if I am doing a survey and I've plugged in Randall Mitchell, and, and a day after Randall Mitchell comes again and you plug it into the same system, how could you have duplication on the GIS survey? All right, and the other question I have to follow up that is where are we with fully digitizing this process from survey to the grants? Because if we, if, if, if when I look at the this is um, page six. When I look at the process, the process is, 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 is a heavy process. It's a long process. And I could understand um, Member Dino Brigger's issue with it not, we, how are we going to finish this in three months with all of this? So where are we with digitizing, with fully digitizing this process? And if we are using online systems, how are we still having duplications? I'm, I'm sure there could be some code written into the system that would be able to trigger um, that this person, this name, may not be the same person, but if two people with the same name comes up, it will trigger something. And it will, a red flag should come up to say that this person is in the system already. With respect to the duplication and the persons on the system, I'll, I'll ask uh, in terms of the checks and balances on the ArcGIS system, if uh, the ministry can share a bit about that. But secondly, in the context of uh, the two systems, the way forward will speak to integration or identification of a core system. So, right. so but in terms of where we are, um, I would ask for the current status and that we can speak to the issue of the digital, the digitization of various processes at the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, if that's possible. Thank you. I will ask Mr. David to go into that nitty gritty because he actually manages the system. Uh, we did, uh, was speaking about that in preparation for this meeting of how, what questions the committee may ask and that came up.
Um, Ms. DeLeon will, will, will tell you more about what happens on the system because remember, she is interrogating the system for the purpose of giving the grant. That's not us at Rural Development, we not doing that. So she, will, she interrogates the system. Um, but it's, it's, it's simple and she will tell you how it's difficult to fool the system now. And um, it, she, she knows how to eliminate them by, by, um, by ID card number and, 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 and things like that. She can do that. Um, we are concerned about doing the thing accurately when we go out. And um, you, you asked an important question because she and I spoke about it up to last week. And I was saying that we have to find ways to lessen the, 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 um, the narrative to lessen the narrative by putting Dropbox, and you can analyze data easily when you have it in this, in a, in this format. It, you, you can't analyze the, um, the narrative that you're writing, but you can, you know, so we, could, we, we are changing stuff like um, how many children you have are under five and go to primary school. Those types of things will give us more data to see how many, when we're analyzing that data, we could see how many children were impacted by this flood in 2022 in this particular area throughout the country. That is, is what um, the, the digitizing helps, helps us with. And it will lessen what we are writing. And the narrative that we write is so critical to social development. Because if they don't see, if they don't, for instance, if we do an application and we forget the ID card number on that field, That looks very material, but there's an, but we, we took a pic, didn't we? We took a picture with the person's face, the ID card number back and front, so you know the ID card number. But social may be a little picky and yeah, say, but, listen. But, but, but Mr. David, and, and this is precisely what we're trying to find out. Yes. All these things that may appear um, as in, in your circumstances, inconsequential because there's another mean. These are important me mechanisms for verification, for social, social development, and that's why you all need the collaboration and the training. But really to focus on Ms. Ms. D Ms. Lee, Ms. D um, Ms. Henry, in, in terms of, I guess the best way, you could give us an example of how this is working. How many applications you got from the flood whether it's through your, your portal or whether it's through survey one, two, three, how many applications you got from the flood in 2022? We received a total of, uh, from the a combined total from the systems of 5,454. 5, 5,000, yeah. 5,454 yeah. as at December the 31st, 2022. 5,454, you told me? Yes. And of these 5,454, how many duplications you had? In terms of... Uh, identified duplications based on the amount of forms we have interrogated so far, we have a total of 175 duplicates. You have 175 duplicates? Yes. Out of based how many the, interrogated so far? Based on the 2,894 that have been 2, examined. 2,894 that have been examined. Okay. All right. Uh, the mathematicians among us will know how much percent that is, but that's less than 10%. Okay, Madam, maybe about eight percent. Just one yeah. minute, and, and just to advance the conversation. Um, as of the thirty-first of December, twenty twenty-two, to today's date, or let's say yesterday's date, okay, you've only dealt with about half of the applications. That is correct. And of the half that you have dealt with, how many you have paid? How many payments you have made? We have a total of 1,080 checks that have been collected. We have 175 that are outstanding. Let me just do the maths on that. You mean mean outstanding? You mean to be collected? To be collected. 175? So that is 1,255 checks. 
Okay, let me ask you something. Is that rate satisfactory or not? For me, no. What can you do to improve that? You. Because we hear all about this technology. And quite frankly, if I were in the flood and I was getting $550 one time and I needed that, I did. Okay? So we've heard all the nice, lovely narrative about what exists. What we want to understand is how does it work and how can it work better? That's what all of this is about. So you tell us because you operate the system. And quite frankly, I will say this. If I cost, and you all should be able, I'm going to ask the PS to cost this lovely process flow on page six per application, right? Cost it in terms of man hours and salary and prorate that against a $550 grant and tell me if this making sense. Yes, Deputy, Permanent Secretary. Um, Chair, the $550, that is um, temporary food card, mm -hmm. and we give that to the relief, um, people who are seeking relief immediately. It does not go through that process. It has no process. The process that you have seen there, when we have a disaster, we put aside a means test that we would usually use for the food card. Once the clients have been identified, once a need is identified, either by or people who are out in the field or parliamentary representatives or people from the corporation, when a list is submitted, this is immediate. We provide these cards okay. immediately. So, so let me understand this. Your temporary food support only has to do with disasters? Usually with disasters, we use the temporary food support for it. Now we have a food No, support. hear what I've asked, and I'm very yes. specific. Yes. You only use temporary food support, because I am confused, eh? I, I, I want to say this, yes. and it may have nothing to do with you all. Yes. I am saying up front, I am totally confused by these submissions, and, and, and maybe it, you have a responsibility to help okay. um, declutter what is happening in my brain. The temporary food support mm -hmm. is only if I have a disaster, meaning flooded out? No, um, no. no chair. Okay. You have persons who might actually walk off the street and would have been deemed food poor. Mm -hmm. or they might have been waiting on a grant to be processed, mm -hmm. the same food support, and they're waiting for it to be completed, a means test was done for them. They have been deemed food poor. They cannot wait until the process is finished, and that information comes to the food support unit because all that information is done, it is submitted in the interim while they're waiting for that process to be concluded, these persons are given a temporary food card. You also have individuals who might come off the street sometime and they are deemed food poor. You send for a means test and the case has been identified that they really need this food. They find a way there because they have a need. A temporary food card is used. Okay. Therefore, it's not only in the event of a flood or a disaster like fire or something like that, that you give a temporary food card. Okay, so we're dealing with, with flood. Yes. Tell me what happens in the case of Mr. X is living in Area Z. There is a flood. Mr. David and his people go in, they send the pictures, they upload, whatever, whatever, it gets to Miss Henry. Okay. I need food because everything in my house is washed away. What we understand, want to understand is what kind of support I'll get in 
we just dealing with food right now. What is the process and how long does that take? That's what we're asking. Okay. I'm not able to give a definite timeline, uh -huh. but what I can tell you is from the experience of the last flood, I have seen when a list is provided, it's immediate. These cards are provided immediately. Mm -hmm. When you have an assessment being done out of the, on the field, you would have some application where you see put there food. No, let's food. Just, just, just deal with food. Yes, because, I'm talking about yeah, food. Uh -huh. they, are, they would have identified food is required. When this information comes, the unit would send out information to saying that they need some food cards for these people. They get it onto them with their ID number and the like. The list goes out. They actually go and distribute this. For this year, we have had officers actually go out to the bamboo area, I know. A list was provided. And they actually went out on site to distribute to these persons who were deemed food poor because of the flood. They needed food. Okay. Because their food were um, so, so the list would have been provided by whom? It was provided by a member from that area through um, a minister. And how is this verified? Okay. I don't have that information right now. But so Mr. David and they don't have any plan, part their verification process has that, no part in that. That was not part of this particular one that okay. I'm telling you about. Uh, and just to help okay. me get on your page quite quickly, yes. Mrs. Guy Hernandez. Yes. If I understand it well, this is something that happened in November 2022. Right? Yes. Is on. that the system that is going to um, project forward for the floods that we do want, but which are likely to happen in 2023? Mm -hmm. Or have we learned from that and we've put something in place for food relief in the event of a flood? We're only talking about flood. We know they have all kind of disaster. So we have learned, as usual, from every event, the ministry continues to learn, look at our systems, and tweak it to treat with things that will come up in the future. Now, our food support systems in particular, it's a work in progress. And coming out of this event and other things that have been happening, we at the ministry have been reviewing some of our processes and looking to put structures in place to ensure that we are able to, able to effectively treat not only with food support, but other grants that we have at the ministry. Yeah, you, you see, I, I, and thank you so much, and I, I really do commend that. Um, but I, I want to stick with food for now. Yes. We're going to deal with all the others, because I, I get the impression, and I might be wrong, that when it came to 2022, mm -hmm. it was almost as a... I want to choose the right word, but the only thing I could think about is a knee joke. But maybe somebody here might have a better word, okay? Uh, and, uh, and therefore, whatever situation we found ourselves in in 2022, uh, it, it, it doesn't appear that we had something in place mm -hmm. to give people immediate food support. Mm -hmm. What are the lessons learned? And... Because everybody on both sides of the table talking climate change, mm -hmm. I can't say, and I'm not a climatologist, but I can't say that we have till November 2023 to put something in place, right? Yeah. So I want to know what it is that you all have actively learned mm -hmm. and what you are going to treat with so that if something like that, God forbid, happens, yeah. Good Friday, 2023, how do we get immediate food support to people who need it? Okay. With, of course, the checks and balances of verification and all else that goes with it. Because it, it appears to me that somebody come to, 
to us with a list, and I ain't seen anything wrong with that somebody, and I had 20 names on the list, and I get 20 food cards, and I went out there, and I give to 20 people. Okay, let me clarify that. Even if a list came to the ministry, these lists would have the prospective client's name and ID numbers. And we are not in the practice of handing um, food cards over to members of the public to issue to persons out there. In fact, what happened is that our staff went out to the particular site in question. We had a combined team of officers from food support um, and SDP. We went out and we actually distributed. Individuals had to provide their ID numbers and they would sign for these cards. Even though the list was provided, we had to ensure that in distributing it gets to the persons who needed the food. No cards were left out there. What was not distributed on the day came back to the ministry. And you had these individuals, they were given the option to come to the office and collect. Out at, in that um, case, we had 190 something, um, 160, I think, collected on the day, and we had about 30 something remaining. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that clarification, um, Deputy Permanent Secretary. Um, just if I ask Member Mark, I just want to ask one thing. So, in given food support in, in that kind of disaster, qualifications with respect to whether I'm a citizen and that kind of thing is is not um, applicable. Am sure, I correct? That is, that is always applicable. If you note, I said the ID, that is our national ID. Yeah. We would but, have used that. But the only reason why I've asked is that looking at the 2022 Auditor General's report, mm -hmm. and this is with respect to some of the grants they all do, there are instances where the ID numbers do match the person who's supposed to be, and that the IDs are not national IDs and that kind of thing. So I, I, I'm not saying that to embarrass anybody. I'm just trying to, to, to interrogate our process to see how do we deal with risk, fraud, and, and, and verification and, and confirmation. Okay? That's really where, where I'm at. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll call on Member Mark, and then I'll call on Member Mitchell. And then Member Morris, in that order. No, no, no. I just wanted to point out that. Okay, go ahead, Member Mitchell. It appears that Member Mark is willing to give way. No, just, just on, on your point, on page four, by the ministry's submission, they indicated that in 2022, all criteria were set aside to facilitate the quick delivery of food support. I do recall, so that's why four. I asked the question. Yeah. Hey. Madam Chair, oh, sorry. Um, through you, the criteria I spoke about at that point in time would have been the means test. And they would have, on page four, they would have listed the other things that they set aside. However, in order to collect the food card, your national ID must be presented because we have to still account at the ministry for each of those cards that we issue. Chair, I am seeking some elementary clarification before I can drill down further. I would like to ask, first of all, if I heard correctly, that up to December of 2022, the Ministry of Social Development, under, under the flood relief program, had received just about 5,454 applications. Am I right? Up to December of 2022. That I'm not correct. too sure if I'm right or wrong. Clarify for me. That is correct. 
That's correct. Okay. Would you want to give us a disaggregation as it relates to the periods? The last major flood, as I recall, was in sometime last year, November 2022. I don't want to believe between November of 2022 and December of 2022, you had 5,454 applications. So I would want to believe it would have come over a period of time. So would you be kind enough to disaggregate for this committee as it relates to first flooding or the last major flooding was 1,200. And by December 22nd, December of 2022, we got uh, and the following applications, 500. So there's a deficit. And then prior to that, there was another major flood. And we received so many applications and so many were processed. So could you explain to this committee what was the disaggregation and the floods that visited our country so that we will have an, uh, an overall determination as to how many citizens <coughs> would have gone through the system properly because you have the Ministry of Rural Development doing assessments and they cannot be conducting fraudulent assessments. It has to be proper assessments. And those reports are submitted to the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. So I am assuming the relationship has credibility between local government and social development. So if that is so, kindly explain to this committee what is the reality facing citizens? I have estimated, Madam Chair, close to 4,000 people as of December 2022 never received any food relief grants whatsoever because they have not been processed. So with all these apps that we are talking about, let us deal with apps and let's deal with the systems that we have in these ministries, like social development, to speed up the process and the processing. Explain, and I will have further clarification to add, because I really need a disaggregation. Member, and through the chair, uh, given the level of disaggregated data by the specific periods in question, uh, the ministry would like to request to, su to submit that in writing um, in order to be able to answer specifically the quantums and the periods being requested. Thank you. And, yes. and Madam Chair, I concede you need to put that in writing. So, so let us just have an understanding. Therefore, if you look at the last major flooding incident in our nation, November 2022, could you tell this committee how many applications was received, genuine applications that were received by the Social Development Ministry for processing and issuing ultimately grants, re flood relief grants, to citizens who experience dislocations as a result of that flooding. How many applications were received? Okay, so um, we said we'll get that in right then. No, um, uh, you remember, Madam Chair, if I may, we're talking about 5,400 something. So we're going right back in the times. I am just focusing, I'm simplifying it for you. You have to submit it in writing. 
But I want to see how updated you are in your systems. So if you, if you can tell this committee, in the last flooding, which was just recent, November, how many applications, Madam Chair, did social I, I development... Think, I think Ms. Henry said to us, unless I am mistaken, as of December, they got combined from their system, their portal, and um, survey one, two, three, 5,454 yes. applications. Yes. That's what they got this, they from the flood in 2022, which you are saying you don't accept, but that's what we were told. That, so was, that was the total? That was the total. Oh. Ms. Henry went on to say okay. that okay. they have processed 2,894. Okay. Of that, there were 175 duplications, mm -hmm. which is about 6%. They have processed about a hundred, a thousand and eighty checks. Okay. I know they 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 assess process twelve hundred and fifty five checks. A thousand and eighty have been collected, and okay. one seventy five are still to be collected. Okay. I, I think that's what. Okay. Okay. I I thought yeah. what you were asking, and maybe that's what um, DPS Jamtran understood. Okay. That you were asking if there were rolling over figures. From prior periods, so yes. I think there was I, some no, flooding was, in February 2022. Yes, yes. Well, so I, th I think that's yes, what you were asking, yes, and what yes. the, the PS asked an opportunity for okay. to get the disaggregated yes, figures. Correct. Okay, yes, so we all on the same page now. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, uh, I am going to just skip the orders. I couldn't. Uh, if you all will please indulge me, because remember, Hislop was in flight when I am um, like the kite. Um, no, well, give him as well. You, no, Madam Chair, you, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but um, I didn't only do that. I, I went on to somebody else, so I, I'll give no, you the floor right. now. But what I, what, Again, I apologize. That's okay. What, what we were trying to get at is if, if the system is in real time, um, because we're talking about shortening the process from the disaster to the relief. And we're talking about the major grants. We're not talking about, I wasn't speaking about food support. So if we if we in real time, why do we one, why do we have duplications and how are we going to shorten this process so that we could really get it to three months? Because based on what we've seen here, those those six bullet points or the six steps is not gonna be completed in three months. We know the bureaucracy of the of the public service, so we know that. Because if you have five thousand, if you have five thousand applicants and we see in Based on your submission, that the that the um, the process has to go through the the deputy PS, the PS accounts department, all of that. How are we getting five thousand plus applications through that system um, within three months? And how how could we shorten it? Because as as Madam Chair said, if I face the disaster, I I honestly can't wait three months. Or six months, because by the time I get the grant, another flood may come. So how how do we intend to shorten shorten that period? Member through the chair, and again, um, just in terms of our director NSDP, who's uh, working on this on a daily basis. Part of the approach of the ministry um, speaks to understanding some of the key challenges, and I'll just highlight um, a couple. One in particular, even though the ministry receives the information as accurate as it may be, when the ministry attempts to sometimes contact persons via telephone, the persons may not be accessible. Additionally, uh, persons change addresses because obviously they are affected where they are and they may have to relocate to another location for one reason or the other. So inherent in the process are some factors which really would be with a bit beyond the direct remit of the ministry in, in that context. However, in keeping with the issue of processing, um, part of the ministry's overall approach, and, and 
Member Chudichi, I think you raised this earlier, the issue of standardizing, streamlining, and harmonizing the approach to the use of technology, and you mentioned uh, the digitalization of the process. And that process is currently um, in, and I, I want to say in a, in a uh, significant area of development with regards to the implementation um, of the information system that will treat with social services or support the delivery, I should say, of social services um, inclusive uh, of this particular service. Additionally, um, in terms of streamlining, and that's part of the internal process of the ministry to continue to look at the, the examples of the current system, what are some of the shortfalls, clearly which would be time. So in any process improvement, we, we look at three critical elements, three critical ingredients. Um, one is obviously the process, two, the technology, and three, the people element that's needed to support these processes. Because as digital as we'd like to be, there are elements which require boots on the ground to be able to reach those that are desperately in need of services. And as part of that approach, the director has also put forward a request for some additional human resources to be able to sort of bolster this response. And in keeping with, with, with some of the points made earlier, the scope, scale, and complexity of a disaster is very difficult to predict in terms of providing appropriately scaled resources to respond within certain time frames. However, based on the previous experiences of the ministry, and I'm sure uh, our director could speak a bit to that, the ministry has been looking at right-sizing, if I were to use that approach, in the context of how we approach and respond to those that are vulnerable. So um, I will ask um, uh, the director to probably share just a bit more in terms of that process and process improvement approaches. Thanks. To ask one thing, uh, and Minister Henry, tell me this: um, We've all been to doctors. Many of us have travelled and filled out things electronically. Um, one of the first things when you go to a doctor and you put in your telephone number, they ask you for somebody, some other way to contact you. That's a that's a simple fix, which Mr. David and his people with the technology. Uh, uh, I, I can't understand some of, some, of, some of these challenges, quite frankly. But um, I pass that over to you, Ms. Henry. Madam Chair, yes. So in terms of the information that is received on the form, um, that is where the process starts. So if we have one contact number, and that contact number is no longer in service, then we now have to employ a process where the ministry has to not to disadvantage the client, but we have to send somebody out there to find this person, get additional contact information, and then come back in to complete the process. So the verifier, when they go out, they will do the necessary verification so that when they come in, they are coming in with a verified application that can go forward for payment. If they are unable to verify, then there's unfortunately nothing that we can do in that, in that circumstance. But that is how we have been operating in terms of when we have a form that does not have sufficient information or the information has changed because we have a number of clients as well, we have been calling the persons and the persons don't answer their phones. And some of these forms are coming to me as queries. And because I sit in office late, I will pick up the phone at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the night. I call the person. The person answers. And then I am told, well, I was at work. And when I'm on work, I cannot answer the phone. So I said, OK, great. And I will take the information and pass it on to a verifier so that the form could be verified and completed. So they, we have the challenges, but we are finding ways to overcome the challenges. As DPS indicated, I did ask for additional human resources, as well as we are liaising with 
the IT department so that DPS mentioned the ministry is for advancing our digitization initiatives so that in the very near future, this entire process should be a digital one because right now it starts off as, as an electronic, but then there is a manual backend. So we are moving forward to remove that manual backend. I always say this given the fact that I, I tote files because I want to make sure that people's um, grants don't take too long by me. I would love to be able to tote a tablet at home and sit down at home and just review and approve. But I know Rome wasn't built in a day, and I know that we are far better now than we were before. Because in some instances, I can sit down on my laptop now and I can pull up a record and I can get some information from it. But we just don't have that process there as yet. But we are moving towards that. Thank so, you. So, Madam Chair, just a, just a follow up. If, if we're dealing, step number three is processing. Right? And, and I, I want to say to the chair, the chair, I want to thank you, Ms. Ms. Henry. You seem to be very committed to your work, and I want to thank you for, for your service. But if I'm at step number three with processing, if the verification is fine, if you could find me, and my form is OK, my application is OK, how long does processing take for me? I'm dealing with one person. So you, pu you pull me out of the 5,000, and everything is fine with my, with, my, with my application. How long does step number three take? Because after that is approval and payments. Step number three takes a day. Takes a day? A day. So if everything is okay with your application, the verifier will sign it off, indicate what is the relief. It goes on to a clerk, we'll put it on a pay sheet, and then that goes forward for approval. So we're saying that the biggest issue... Well, it issue goes forward for checking after, sorry, and then approval. So we're saying the biggest issue is the verification. Yes, the verification and validation and verification. Validation, verification. validation can happen in the office, but verification, if there, is, if there are issues on that, that application, then it can be referred to a verifier who has to now go on the field to verify some information or the validity of the claim. All right, so then how long does step four take? Step four can take anywhere from one to three days, but I would, I would ask that the, the DPS um, respond to that, but I know that they, they tend to process very quickly. So, so, be, so far, before the DPS answers, so far, Madam Chair, what we're seeing is that it's less than, less than a month. So, so then, if we're dealing with single applications, <laughs> but when you bulk it, then we of course have to take into consideration the amount of applications that can be done in a day. Correct. All right. Also, f the fatigue of the the person who is doing that. All right, Understood. the persons who are doing that. So you have to take that into consideration. Yeah, DPS is going to deal with um. C certainly. Um, so just. Uh, through the chair to give some context. These, f these requests are dealt with at the highest priority within 24 to 48 hours. These uh, pay sheets are checked and submitted to the accounting officer who also deems it as high priority. And our DFA also uh, treats with us as high priority in the terms of the preparation of the actual check for the client in question. Um, so within the, the remit of the deputy permanent secretaries and the respective accounting officer, approximately 24 to 48 hours. Thank you. Our biggest issue is the verification and the volume. Uh, as mentioned and true, true to the chair, um, a lot of the verification um, requires that on the ground in some instances, which would mean contacting the client, setting up or visiting as part of that verification, which uh, requires that physical effort to get the respective information to move forward. Once that is verified and 
that's one of the questions I asked, having come into the ministry recently myself, as to once the information is verified, the application is deemed acceptable based on the criteria, the rest of it is really a very sequential and straightforward process. Thanks. M Mr. Deputy P.S., in recent times, how many of those bulk applications you had, 2022 to now, took five days? And, and you could provide that in writing if you don't have any. Sure, no, no problem, because we do have a breakdown in terms of uh, the number uh, of pay sheets and so on, and we will provide the Thank information. you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Webster Roy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, through you, um, I listened to Ms. Henry and I could hear the passion and you know the commitment to her work. And this question is to the DPS Ramcharan. We have a Ministry of Digital Transformation. Ms. Henry said she would love to be able to get, um, get home with a tablet and you know expedite the work. How are you leveraging the expertise and the resources available at the Ministry of Digital Transformation to help to improve processes? at social development so that the, the greater citizenry would benefit. Thank you. And through the chair, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services works closely with the Ministry of Digital Transformation. In fact, there is a team from the Ministry of Digital Transformation which resides at our ministry on a daily basis in the context of the service transformation element in addition to the use of the technology that supports that, that transformation. So the Ministry of Digital Transformation has provided um, on the ground daily resources that, that's working with the ministry in terms of its planning, its designing of systems, its change management elements, as well as its process reengineering where required. The, the as is, to use some context, the as is and the to be processes with, with, with a view to optimizing those processes in the context of delivering to our clients at large. Thank you. So um, given that we have the Ministry of Digital Transformation working closely with the Ministry of Social Development, what is the end date? When can we expect the real change to happen? Thank you. And in terms of projections, over the, uh, over the next quarter, this ministry, over the next uh, month or two, this ministry expects to have what it considers to be phase one of the project operationalized. And that, the, uh, that particular phase will set the tone as a, as a sort of um, lessons learned to be able to scale the projects up in, a, in the context of the delivery of services in a number of areas for the ministry. Thank okay. you. So, uh, Member Maurice Julian. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, Madam Chair, I would like to direct this to the DPS of Social Development and Family Services. Now, I would like to state that in November, I had a pleasant experience in that my areas had flooded after visiting maybe a week after, almost every person was seen about. And the one particular person who did not get the assistance did not officially reside in the area. So I just wanted to say that because it was the first time I experienced something like that because I have been dealing with disaster through our local government background. So I have a fair idea of how slow it can be and I was actually pleased at how quickly it went. I do have one question regarding the food card. Now, it's a value of $550, which is enough for maybe two weeks. What happens in the scenario that the persons or persons are not yet on their feet? What is the next step for that? Okay, if they continue to be in need um, after the two weeks, most of the time, our people out on the field will indicate that. Okay. 
If they are able to indicate that and that information comes back, then we are able to treat with it. But usually, the temporary food cards, that's to treat with people immediately. A two weeks time allows them to do some investigation and to determine if they continue to be food poor or in a state where they need that. If that is identified and that information comes back, it's treated with urgently at the ministry. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to hear that as an MP. Now, let's discuss squatters. Is it the same process? If someone is squatting without permission on state land and they're affected by a man-made or natural disaster, are they able to access all these funding grants? If I could respond to that one through you, Chair. So with respect to the food support, yes. Um, clothing grant, school supplies grant, yes. Um, and also the household items grant. Uh, rental assistance as well if it is the property was destroyed and they need to get assistance there. However, as it relates to the minor house repair and the sanitary plumbing, we require documentation as to land ownership, okay. property ownership or authorization. Yes. And that can come in the form of authorization, a non-objection letter from the land settlement agency or the commission of state lands or whichever agency is governing the particular lands that the squatter is occupying. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I'm very heartened to hear that. Now, I have one final question through you, Madam Chair. Fraud. Now, through my experiences as a former local government councillor, there was one particular gentleman that will bring out the same couch set Every single rainy season. Every single rainy season. And now that I'm an MP, I'm interested in, is this bottlenecking the system, these fraudulent claims? What is the process? And if we can get perhaps a number of how many fraudulent cases that you all discovered now, this is also, there's a scenario, husband and wife, same household, but claiming to be separated. These types of um, cases and what exactly happens? What is the process? Thank you. Thank you. And in terms of the, the breakdown, I'll ask uh, Ms. DeLeon to speak to the issue with, re with respect to cases which may require further investigation, certainly they are, and, and, <laughs> and you, will, you will be able to get uh, some, some details there. Uh, but with respect to uh, specifically the term fraud, so, so there, there are two tiers, if, if I may, the, the first one, investigation, because something doesn't seem right and that's where the ArcGIS system also plays a key role because pictures are uploaded so in some cases you may be able to compare those but to speak to the specifics of it i'll ask uh, the director to share uh, specifically in terms of that response thanks thank you and through you chair all right so clearly you and i probably know the same gentleman with the same couch all right, so it's unfortunate um, when these things happen and uh, persons who are genuinely impacted and in need, um, their applications have to get mixed in with, with persons who not so genuinely would have ensured that they would have had an application in as well. So in terms of... Uh, how many instances so far we have 57 suspicious applications for which we are doing further um, investigation one of those applications the a report was submitted to the executive of our ministry and the further action will be determined um, henceforth uh, 
In terms of the process to treat with fraud, I would uh, um, defer to my colleague uh, from the investigation and compliance unit. Uh, and I just want to respond in terms of the same household because that is definitely a scenario that we are experiencing. So we have instances where persons from the same household would have applied. And in some cases, persons would have indicated that they were not aware that they could not have applied. But what I can say is that on this occasion, we are greatly helped with the ArcGIS survey one, two, three, because of the pictures. So now I'm able to see the same couch and recognize that it is the same couch. And we, we are able to identify um, based on the photos that these are pictures from the same location. So that is assisting us. Yes, we are, it is bottlenecking the system because when you have cases like that, you have to assign resources to conduct field investigations. And those resources could have been better utilized elsewhere, dealing with the genuine application. So I would ask my colleague to speak to um, the ministry's fraud process. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Trio. All suspected cases of fraudulent activity within the ministry are reported to the Investigation and Compliance Unit and where it is determined that there may be fraud or corruption, it is sent to the police service for further investigation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I just do, I have one last question to the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, to Mr. David. Mr. David, I was heartened to hear that you all anticipate the natural disasters, but what happens in this scenario? And I'm sure you would understand Madam Chair, for non-traditional flooding areas, what is the process? And also, in a purely selfish point, for other disasters, such as fire, what is the process? And I'm asking this because I know in my particular constituency, it took four weeks for a DMU officer to visit a fire victim. So I really want to know the timeline and especially in areas that you will not be anticipating, for example, floods, but it just so happened it was too much and the area flooded. Yeah. Thank okay, you. so um, Member Morris Julian, uh, I, <laughs> I understand the whole um, desire to deal with disasters in their entirety, but unfortunately, this is not the remit of this no, inquiry. No problem, Madam Chair. I and um, I know Mr. David is always so willing to volunteer and, and cooperate. But um, I would really ask if you could hold on that question. Um, we may be able to do some follow-up. Mr. David had come with ODPM when we had done things with natural disasters, so we may be able to do some follow-up with that. Um, but let's remember that... Um, Rural development and local government is really just here in aid of the inquiry, which is really flood relief. Okay, so I'm really sorry. Um, I think there's, therefore, if I can, if you're finished, yes? Okay, so I, I have member the Norberga down. Okay, you're finished? Yes. Okay, sure. All right. Um, just now, Member Mitchell, I don't even have your name down, but I promise you I'll put it down now. <laughs> so I have Dr. Bodo. Um, Dr. Bodo, please. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, and just, just two points, and, really, and I probably could um, direct this at the either PS from the Ministry of Social um, Development and Family Services. The first refers to the rental assistant assistance grant um, deputy PS now they, they have been some concerns about um, about l late payment of these grants um, and because of that some providers are unwilling to to provide 
the emergency accommodation in these situations. Can you give us an update as to the process involved and whether that in fact is an issue? Thank you, uh, Member. Through the Chair, as far as I'm aware, um, these grants are paid, but I will ask our, our DFE to probably shed some light in terms of the actual processing of those payments in question. Thank you. Good afternoon, through the Chair. Once the application comes to accounts, they are in um, process one time. We receive rental assistance from the social welfare division, and then we process it in accounts for payment. But funding is always allocated for that grant under the UTA vote, on urgent temporary. Is that the one you are speaking yeah, about? Yeah. And just to, be, just to be clear, the payments are made directly to the providers of the Whoever is on the, the application, yes. We, right. yes. And that is never an issue as far as backlog and so on, you're saying that? No, once we, it is received in accounts, it is processed. All right. Um, the second issue is, is regards to the um, on page seven with the process. And again, I come back to the point of the single telephone number because it, it is sad indeed when a check is prepared and ready and you can't access the, the person who, who needs it. Um, is consideration being given to any other method, any other way of reaching these people? And I say this because certainly if you contact the member of parliament office, we can locate these people, I mean, nine out of 10 times. And I speak to that because many of these individuals, because of their needy situation, sometimes they change their phones at short notice so they may not have money on the phones and so on. So I'm just throwing it out in the air that perhaps the Office of the Members of Parliament could be used, but then you'll have to put that into your database. It's just something to think about. The, the other point is in terms of the distribution of the checks now, I see the checks are dispersed at the Accounts Department at the Ministry's head office. So two questions, and that's in Port of Spain, which may be not very convenient for those residing in the Deep South and so on. So two questions, is that the only place that um, recipients can collect their checks? And if that is the case, um, will consideration, where its consideration can be given to other more convenient locations? Yes, you mentioned that and you open remarks that the ministry is intended to be dynamic, service-oriented, and client-focused approach, so in regards to that. Thank you, Member, and through the Chair. At this time, uh, the head office is the primary location, and based on the um, points raised here today, the ministry will certainly explore, as per the recommendations, in terms of putting in uh, other possible mechanisms accordingly. Madam Chair, I would like to find out once applications are accepted or the pending approval, is there any mechanism or system to keep the potential recipient of the flood relief? grants informed to the effect that their application is being processed so that the frustration that would arise when people are not hearing because they are yet to receive their grants, is there any mechanism in place to ease the frustration? of genuine applicants? Do you communicate? Do you write? How, how is it um, addressed, if at all? Thank you, and uh, through, through the chair, once an application requires further attention, there are immediate steps to contact the applicant primarily based on the uh, phone numbers or contact numbers provided. If that fails, the field supervisor, the, 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 the resource that's on the ground, is notified so that the attempt to visit
physically the homes or households in question to be able to reach those persons. Additionally, um, based on, an, on, on the effort identified earlier in terms of an integrated approach, there is also communication with other um, officials, uh, other official mechanisms that may be on the ground. And let me just ensure that I'm not leaving out any possible options and ask um, the Director, National Social Development Program, if there are any other mechanisms in place at this time to ensure timely information gets to those clients in terms of their processing. Thank you. Um, and this second question, Madam Chair, um, has to do with um, those suspicious fraudulent applications. When were this, when were they discovered? Thank you, uh, Trudy Chair. So pinpointing a particular discovery time would be based on when the application in question is, is uh, being processed. So once the application is received, as we've um, identified earlier, those applications are then uh, processed by, by NSDP. And upon the, the review of that application in the context of it meeting the, the requirements as set out, um, so, to, so to indicate a particular point in time um, would be a bit challenging to, to give specifics as to when um, for the issues that need further investigation at this point in time. The only, the only reason I raise this, Madam Chair, is um, in the submission I have before me, the issue of fraudulent applications, um, I thought maybe could have been an oversight. Maybe there would have been need for the ministry to categorize when we talked about fraudulent application to at least inform our committee that while there is no confirmed fraudulent cases as it relates to applications, there are 57 or 50 suspicious applications that are currently under review so that the committee would have been guided accordingly. So I don't know if that might have been an oversight. Through the chair, Madam Member, as at the 30th of December, the period up to when we would have presented that response to this committee, we had no application that was deemed necessary for further investigation. The updated figure you are seeing is coming out of our continued processing of applications. So it was not an oversight. Okay, thank you. Member Mitchell, finally. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I have a question. The first question that I have um, touches on public administration, and it, it refines a bit what um, Member Morris Julian was just asking. So you will tell me if this question can be asked. Now, Mr. David indicated that he, he knows when he, who is going to get hit, and he knows when they are going to get hit. So with that sort of crystal ball, has any analysis been done with respect to, by the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government and the corporations, with respect to any mitigating measures? Because we're talking about spend, taxpayer spend. So the taxpayer can spend money by way of these grants or the taxpayer can spend money by way of improving the infrastructure. So has there been any analysis on mitigation measures that can be put in place? That's the first point, the first question. The second question is, has there been any analysis by the both ministries whether this process can be handed over to the first responder which is the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government and the corporations, rather than this bifurcated process 
where one checks, one assesses, and hands over to the other person. First question, well, first two questions. Um, purely because of how you've tied in this second question, I would allow it. <laughs> okay, but um, certainly, as I said, this is not really um, uh, dealing with disasters and responses to disasters in, in the general sense. Okay, um, so Mr. David. Um, I can answer the second half of it, and I think um, about a year ago, uh, member, that was being bandied about between the Ministry of Rural Development and local government and uh, social development. Because I'm looking at all the figures here now, and um, if we have 14 different entities doing it, it'll be, it'll be spread out a whole lot. A corporation will have to handle, ah, let me give you some figures here. One corporation will have to handle Separia would have had to handle 252. Yeah? And um, Pinal Devi would have had to handle about 400. Rather than one ministry having to handle 5,000 and all of it. So if that works out, and, um, but that's not, that's above my pay grade, madam, <laughs> to say, but I think that's a good idea you have, uh, member, and I would support that. Well, with my little two cents, I could support that, that it will definitely make it a whole list. Not only that, the corporations know the people more than the Ministry of Social Development. Yeah, I keep saying, we know who they are. So that, um, that is something I think, if that is recommended, I hope that the powers that be could probably go in that direction. Right. Um, first question, Mr. Mitchell. In terms of the flood mitigation, the disaster mitigation measures. Okay, um, guided by the chairman that we're dealing with flooding. Um, in terms of our development program, it is something that we had discussions with, with the Ministry of Finance. Because we, um, when I assumed office in January, uh, one of the things I wanted to look at is, as you rightly said, if we can increase our mitigation response, we can reduce the number of flood relief grants that we will have to pay out. So we are looking at our development program again uh, in conjunction with the regional corporations. There, and what we're looking at basically is our, those roads and bridges that are under the regional corporations that the regional corporations can look to improve on as what we do at head office as well because head office does does perform some work in that area. And we also collaborated with the Ministry of Works and Transport in terms of the old drainage um, issue. I think November, 9, November 2022 is a watershed year because when I came in and I was looking at the historical data and everything, I think one of the things that we have to do, and this is part of the whole local government reform initiative, is that if we can get to the regional corporation, the resources, both not only financial, because a lot of regional corporations say it is human resources that they need to continuously do the maintenance of the main water courses and so forth. Because we know where, the, as Mr. David said, we know where the flood prone areas are. And as much as we have humanly possible can do in terms of reducing the, the stress to, to, the, to the population in those particular regions, we will try to do that. But it's something that the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government is looking at, not only in the context of the reform agenda, but in terms of our annual development program, in terms of where we can assist in terms of improving the, the resilience of the communities to flash flooding and to flooding. We may not be able to do complete all, but we will try as much to mitigate those circumstances. And our early warning system that Mr. David spoke about will also help us and two, now one of the things, honorable member, as we am um, sticking to flood so that the chairman um, wouldn't have to direct, one of the things I, I noticed when I came to the ministry and I asked the question, we do not have on our law books mandatory evacuation. I, I, I noticed that, that in our response, it's voluntary. And I think that may also help in some mitigation circumstances in terms of how if we, if we can let people know that 
the riverine alerts that we put out from our emergency operations center to our community, listen, this river is going to crest in 12 hours or four hours, you need to evacuate and so forth. If we have some sort of framework that allow us to enforce, in a way, for your own safety, movement out in advance, I think we can mitigate to do your question in terms of flooding. I, I, think, so I think we're moving beyond the scope now. Uh, I'm sorry, because we're talking loss of property and not necessarily loss to um, damage to person or personal injury, right? Um, let me ask second uh, question to the Ministry of Social Development. Now, I'm looking at your criteria for the receipt of grants by citizens, and I'm assuming that this is the full criteria, and there isn't a means test here. So the question is, where there is an area that is hit by flash flooding or some natural disaster, a flood, is it that all the citizens who are hit can make an application to the Ministry of Social Development? Thank Any you. and all. So if I am living in an area and I make above $8,000 a month, above 10000 above 15000 whatever your threshold is, am I able to apply and receive assistance? So thank, thank you, Member, through the Chair. Uh, anyone can make an application for assistance. However, that process of verification, uh, as mentioned in, in terms of the check speaks to the issue of whether the home is insured or it's not insured. So there are some elements um, in terms of, of checks. And I'll ask again, Ms. De Leon, to speak specifically to the, to the assessment of those components. Thanks. Thank you, DPS. Through you, Chair. So if someone is impacted by a disaster and if their property is insured, they are not eligible for disaster relief because the insurance company would be the first port of call for any type of assistance. However, um, with respect to disaster victims, it means that is weird, uh, reason being a disaster um, is a, a shock. So for example, you can have income within the household, but if, let us say, your, your house is flooded with eight feet of water, you did not cater for that. So all of your items would have been damaged. You may have also suffered structural damage to the property. So the assumption is made that your income, your monthly income, as the case may be, would not be able to provide you with the support to bring you back to some level of normalcy. But how do you make that assumption if you don't do a means test and you don't know what my income is? And the, that's the first point. And the second point is, how do you prove that somebody is or is not insured? I would, and I would expect that you do an affidavit or something. Because if I'm insured, you are not able to check that independently of me. And if, I'm just using what you have said, mm -hmm. if there's structural damage to your, to my house, then if the process takes three months and, and more, I would have earned one, two, three, four salary payments. So I'm gleaning from you that there is no policy in terms of a disaster where you know, the income of the person is taken into consideration, the income of the household is taken into consideration. If I have a car, for example, the car is, the car is parked under my house, the car is damaged, the car is third party, it's not insured. Is it that the, you get compensated with respect to that property? We're talking about assessors. I don't anticipate, I don't expect that the assessors are qualified in checking a fridge or in checking a stove. They don't have those qualifications. How are those things checked? Mm -hmm. Because then, 
you give giving credence to what people say all the time, that the ministry is just engaged in giving away money. And the last thing I would ask as well is in terms of, um, I hear you with the digital process, and we welcome it. I'm not wowed by it because the time for being wowed by digital processes is long gone. The difference between paper and digital is time. But the problem has always been the person who is inputting, yeah, inputting the, the information in there, and the persons who have been arrested for corruption are not the persons who are making the applications. It's persons from within your ministry. So that touches on the auditing function. How do you audit? You see a picture, yes, but how do you go in and check to see if the fridge really um, mash up or if it's just... A $200 repair, a stove. I'm sorry, I, I skipped a few rounds, so I have a lot of questions and I'm hitting you <laughs> one, one after the other. But those are my questions. I mean, it, it, if those things are absent, then we generally have to really look at the, the whole disaster relief management in the ministry. But I'll give you, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Member, through the chair. Um, the, the first responders play a vital role in the immediate assessment, be it the, the persons from the disaster unit that's on the ground. Uh, that's where, um, as mentioned earlier, part of those checks, whether the refrigerator is plugged in and so on. Um, from the ministry, our field assessors are part of the visits that, take, that would take place should there be a question whether the pictures, et cetera, don't tell the story uh, as it relates to the report and the pictorial evidence that's provided? Uh, those relate to the specific items like a refrigerator, washing machines, um, and uh, furniture, the, the basic uh, living room suite, as some of the elements. and. I would probably defer the first part in terms of the actual checking uh, to the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. And then I'll ask um, Ms. De Leon to speak to the second layer, which is where our persons would go out to the various households um, in terms of validating some of those claims identified. Thanks. Madam Chair and Member, I have been doing this since the DMU started. That's almost 10, 12 years. People who make claims, generally speaking, have genuine claims. I have um, stood in waters myself up to waist high. In bamboo, there was, there, there was water marks above my head. I went into uh, people's home and Every single thing, and most people have fabric furniture. The beds, are, uh, some of the beds still have, um, the frames are wooden frames, chipboard, or any of those types of frame. So when people, um, particularly in those areas, are, are, are crying out, genuinely, 99.9% .9 of them have been impacted. We don't have to have a degree in, um, in, in assessment to figure out, hey, this, th this thing has been underwater. It is water soaked. The mattress is, uh, the mattress is dirty. The Karani River is not very healthy. Where the water, we see where that, where that water covered the vegetation, it scorched it. You guys should have, some of you had a chance to see. It scorched the vegetation. The people's homes, and they had to, they had to sanitize that home. The ministry um, had to give out two truckloads of bleaches, huh? Two truckloads of bleaches to communities for them to clean out because you always have to think about mold and children and that sort of thing. So that um, the, only, the, the only one you could, you could say, the, 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 um, the compressor and the fridge, yeah, that's probably the only one we could think about. And, um, and I've told my assessors, put on the fridge when we go in, because we ain't going to do the assessment in the water. 
So when you go back and you take a look at the fridge, plug it in. I plug in fridge, plug in washing machine, and here it starts. I say, ah, boy, it's working. Very smiley, and I move on. And I didn't put that as part of it at all. However, the person may come back and come back to social development and say, I lost my fridge and I lost my, my, my washing machine. But we know and we put genuinely what is the needs analysis. And my field officers have been trained to do that. And they were trained by this Ministry of Social Development who told us how to do it. So um, I, I would like to... The, the, the folks who are, who are impacted in those areas, you asked about insurance, um, member. These floods impact basically the socio-economically depressed areas. Many of them don't have deeds. Many of them have no insurance. They will not even get insurance. Insurance companies will not even insure them. So I have never gone out and do assessments in my 12 years, or 10 to 12 years in DMU, never once have I seen I have insurance. Never and, saw and that. that. And, and I'm grateful for what you're saying, but that is exactly the problem. I mean, I, I, I hear the, the, the emotive content and you know, your representations here, but we're dealing with a process, and the process must have checks and balances. I hear what you're saying, but have you seen the Auditor General's report? Have you seen persons being arrested in the Ministry of Social Development for fraud? And fraud is a very high threshold, I accept, because what we should be talking about here is gaming the system. And this is a real issue, and this is the issue that we're, we're treating with. I mean, insurance should not be frowned upon. Insurance, everybody is responsible for their own person and property. But we, we also accept that there are persons who need to belong and need to be assisted by the social safety net. So it's a matter of process that we're treating with here. And that is what we're getting to. I think very um, valid concerns that really are concerns that are shared by the entire committee. So um, I, I now call on this, this member. Oh, sorry. I told us member Webster, right? Member Dinobrega. You give way to her? Okay, member Webster. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, every year, almost the same households would make an application, right? Every year. Of the 5,454 persons who you have on your database, how many of them would have received flood relief over the last three years? And also, what is being done to ameliorate the situation? Because, I mean, we must find a way for them to come off <laughs> the system because it's really unfair if every single year specific households are benefiting and then there are communities that may not be able to access support. Member, and through the chair, uh, the ministry will respond in writing with regards to the specifics and, and the numbers associated with that particular question. Thanks. Okay, and Member Dinabaga. Thank you, Chair. Uh, chair, just one Quick question as well. I we're talking about about an incident that occurs. Is there a is there a cutoff time after that incident, after which a person cannot make an application for a particular incident? For a particular incident, yeah. Yes, yes. So, so a flooding incident. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a timeline after which that a person cannot make a make a, um, a clean. Thank you, member. I'll ask uh, Ms. De Leon Henry uh, to speak to that particular question, thanks. The usual practice is within one month that they cannot submit a claim after that. Um, but usually what happens is that the permanent secretary would indicate if there's any deviation from that. 
So, that's, so if we are, if you're looking at a, a, a disastrous sort of incident, then it becomes the PS's call as to whether or not a community can, can claim. Yes, because what we have to take into consideration, depending on the impact, and I would defer to my colleague at Rural Development, um, the assessments being done on the ground. So depending on the time frame, if it is that the area is still inundated with water for a prolonged period of time, then it may need to be extended. So I would re defer to Mr. Um, David in terms of providing a, an additional response in terms of the time frame, because as I said before, if you are flooded out today, rural development may not be able to get to you today to do the assessment. And if it is, the water stays, um, like for example, in some of the areas where there was water there for a week, sometimes two weeks, and they couldn't get to them. And depending also in terms of the number of persons who were impacted and the resources of the ministry to be able to do the assessments, all those are factors that you have to take into consideration. Um, Madam Chair, I, we get to everyone because it's not only for assessments we want to talk to them about. And if we cannot get to somebody within a week, then we have a problem. We need to get to them because they likely they will want water, they will want food, they may want to be extracted to go to a safer location so that we are always, we have to get there. Um, we may not be able to do the assessments when we get there because everything is underwater and we can't see. But getting there, we have to get there to bring relief. And as soon as the water goes down and we could see what is lost and we could examine what they have lost, then we could upload the um, unsurvey one, two, three. So just to continue along that line, um, obviously we're not talking about the regular, the regular source. We're talking about disaster, near disaster sort of thing. Typically, that would not be a month, though. That in situations like that, it will almost never be a month. The PS will always have to make a call. And so, in the, the, what is, in your experience, what is the average timeline between incident and the actual, um, the assessment, that that sort of stuff happening? In terms of between incident and the cutoff, or yes, sorry, my apologies, the right. cutoff, yes. So um, traditionally, I have seen up to ninety days. I, that is as far as I could recall. Um, Madam Chair, if you would I remember, ninety days is quite a bit right? because that has to be um, on the well, yes, on the outer limits. Yeah. But when it comes to with DMU. That's what we do. So we are always at it, and we try to finish our assessments in every, um, we have timelines, two weeks to finish it. If, then we will say, okay, um, based upon how many we are doing. Because remember, we're not doing it with two field officers. We're bringing in a massive amount of people. Sometimes we bring in the police, uh, they, from the police academy, our, our, our police academy, we bring them in to assist because we want to get it done. Uh, However, when the word gets out, here what, here's what happens. When the word gets out in communities that um, assessments being done and people getting grants, it, it, a lot of things, people come out, you know, because those who ain't really get impacted, they come in out too. So that's why I have always had to call um, Ms. De Leon. And I will say, Pat, we need to shut this down <laughs> because, it's, it, because every time People keep coming when they're here. And that's why the same couch is, um, ends up <laughs> being looked at, because people pass the couch from one to the next. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, <laughs> maybe what we, we can ask, um, if the PSS could do first in writing. Um, I, I'm getting a sense that what may apply in an individual case is being um, sort of mirrored in a collective case, right? And, and, and even the submission, the way the submission is done, because if I'm not mistaken, in an ordinary case, somebody may be able to apply as an individual. So there was no 
a, a flooding in an area, but I may have been a victim of some a man-made disaster that I suffered a flood, and I may be able to get some uh, some qualify for one of the grants. Okay, it would be a similar grant that will go to um, uh, uh, a natural disaster where bigger areas are being impacted. And I think what we are trying to focus on is where they have these um, geographic disasters. I don't want to say national because it may not be national, but these geographic disasters, what are the measures that are in place? And, and sometimes in some of the responses, um, I think we confuse confusing what may happen with an individual as to opposed to a community, a, a wider geographic area. So I, I would give to the Ministry of Social Development an opportunity to address the committee in writing with respect to what are your processes when it comes to uh, a, a community being affected. Because I think when Mr. David and Mr. Mitchell speak, they're not talking about individuals. They're really talking about what we hear about. Flood, flood relief because a community or communities have been impacted. Okay? And, and I, I would want to give to the Ministry of Social Development because I don't think the, uh, with all due respect, I don't think the submission has represented you all well um, in, return, in terms of the focus on how you deal with grants going to communities where significant pe numbers of people have been um, affected. Okay? Um, and I, I really do find it um, a, a bit curious that somebody could submit an application for relief 90 days after the incident. Of course, you understand, if a community is under water, that's a, that's a different thing, right? Because it, it, it will mean that you can't actually, you can't actually look at the, the disasters a bit continuous, so continuing, and not a, a, a one day something, occurrence. So the, the answers, I, I think, I give you all an opportunity to address that in writing. We'd, we'd send the, the questions with respect to that. Now, I, I just want to ask, um, Member Mitchell, you have something you want to ask? Yeah, the, the, the thing that we were speaking about earlier, I don't know if you would ask it or if I should ask Go it. Ahead, no, yeah, ask. Um, to the Ministry of Social Development, we just want to understand the source of funding. So, with respect to these disaster relief grants, is the source of funding solely under the recurrent vote urgent temporary assistance? <coughs> and is this urgent temporary assistance further broken down into categories of food support and household item grant? Or is it that somebody who has suffered the adverse consequences of a, a natural disaster able to make an application under these general categories of grants, which may come under a different foot? Because the, the submission wasn't very clear on that. Thank you, Member. Through the Chair, I'll ask uh, our DFE to speak specifically to the uh, budget items and those uh, in particular. Uh, thanks. Through the Chair, um, for the flood from 2022 to November, we received 20 million was allocated under the urgent temporary assistance mm -hmm. line item. Under this line item, there are different categories for rentals, disaster, clothing, and everything that is utilized under this vote. Okay. So, 
is also so, something that is called the GAG, General Assistant Grant, which encompasses all the different line items that is paid under that vote, the urgent temporary assistance. So, so let me just ask something then, um, Ms. Harvey. You, you said in the submission that 20 million on the recurrent, 0400704, and you have 50, 20 million dollars. Could you guide us with respect to that? Because we're not finding a, a line item with respect to 20, we've seen 15. What fiscal year would that be? Not 2022, 2023? Through the church, um, yes, 20, fiscal 2023. Yeah. Based on the disaster that happened in November 2022, the cabinet, they asked us to look within and 20 million specifically to pay the victims of the flood for 2022. So right now we have a revise, the 15 million that you are seeing is under the, in the draft estimates book. So we have a revised allocation of 35 million under the UT to pay other items, including victims of the flood. So it's oh. not, so the money is not earmarked alone just to pay this. We have other things. Okay, so I guess time. that will be dealt with in the immediate review. Yes. So in, in addition to the 20, the 15, you got 20, so it's overall 35. Yes. All right. Um, so again, under that urgent temporary assistant vote, it will not just only be flood relief. It will be the, all those grants that come to anybody. Correct. Could, but yes. because of the flood, you got an additional because, allocation so yes, so to deal with the flood. Yes, so the 20 million is spent for this. But we have other items that we pay during the course of the fiscal. Okay, so explain to me the total sum of funds allocated to disaster relief as of December 2022, was five million. Yes. Yes? That is coming Based from the 20. Based on the question and results, yeah. Yes? Yes. That is coming from the 20 that came just for the flood. Correct. Yes. All right. Um, of that 20, have you received all of the allocation? We received all of the allocation uh, as at the 20th of February. Yes. We paid $9,652,900. So we have a balance of $10,347,100 from the $20 million allocated just to pay whatever sheets we get for the flood victims. Right. So it means that those additional, uh, and Ms. Henry, my maths might be off, those additional, say, 20 Two twenty-eight hundred that Miss Miss Henry has to deal with. That's where the funding will come from. Correct. Okay. All right. Because we, we maximum of twenty million. Well, well, if there's a need, probably management will decide to go back to you, you the ministry of finance. But so far, yes, we were allocated the twenty million. And the fifteen million would take care of other types other of types urgent of, requests yes, yes. throughout the year. Okay. So it does not stop just for the flood. It goes on. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because we were really having a challenge in in understanding um, how that is funded in, in the in the budget. So thank you for that clarification. And Miss Henry, your outstanding twenty, how many, two thousand, whatever other. You have an idea of how soon, because at the rate you're going, it will take another at least another two months. To complete. Uh, yes, Chair. That is why I asked for additional resources so that we can expedite the process. But I am working with a time frame to complete by the end of April. The end of April. Yes. Okay. And it means at this stage, the gates have been closed for the receipt of any other applications with respect to 2022 flooding. That is correct. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to ask the PS, with respect to these, these, these payments that we're making, these um, applications that we are processing, um, in the Auditor General's report that I referred to a little earlier, where instances of um, missing information and so on were identified, 
in your, um, your earlier processing of grants. Things like um, what they said is like 18,867 blank fields in the ID column, which represents payments to 1,973 persons. Missing fields like in dates of births and that sort of thing. Um, what steps have you all taken to mitigate a recurrence of that in, the, in, in, in this instance? Thank you, Madam Chair. As part of the processing within the ministry, uh, those particular fields are now prerequisites for any application going through the system. And as part of the validation and approval process, no application it moves forward unless there is a validated ID. And validated meaning there's a picture on the system that's checked back against the actual number that's on the sheet to ensure that there is accuracy. And in addition to the other areas um, identified, the ministry has put in place those prerequisites as, as indicated ID card and other uniquely identifiable forms of data to, to mitigate as much as possible yeah. that risk of um, as identified earlier. Do you, do you all have an internal audit department and are these um, processes subject to um, internal audit? Yes, uh, yes, Madam Chair, yeah. there is an uh, internal audit, and yes, these go through part of that audit check. Once, um, once the accounts uh, division has completed their process, that's the next uh, When last stage. was one done, an internal audit um, into this? That I will have to ask my colleagues, seeing that I've come in a bit recent to so the organization. Miss. Okay, so could you let us know in writing when last an audit was done, um, what kinds of issues um, the audit would have identified, and what sort of corrective measures have been taken. Thank you. Member Dinoberga. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one last question from me, and I'll be done, Chair. Uh, Member Mitchell raised up a uh, question surrounding the, the individual vote and, and, and the entire process. When we look at all the different grants that are available, um, and the submittal says that um, only one of each grant type can be accessed by a household, is there any, is there a ceiling in terms of a value and amount of grants? Is there any sort of ceiling that any household can um, can access at, in an in an incident in an instance like this. So a financial ceiling or a quantity of grants is there any and is there any ceiling to to what can be accessed by any particular household? Thank you, member. Uh, through the chair, I'll ask uh, the director NSDP to advise uh, in that regard, as well as um, if there. If, if needed, we will provide uh, in writing, but I'll ask um, Mr. Leon Henry to advise. Thanks. Thank you. Through you, Chair. The grants are given per household, uh, so it is one grant per household, with the exception of the, the clothing grant and uh, the school supplies grant, which are given based on um, the number of children who would have been impacted and also the number of persons who would have been impacted. The other grants are one, one grant per household. So in terms of a total dollar value ceiling, there is not, but that is how we operate in terms of one grant per household. So, so what, what, what we are being confused by and, 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 and is if, for instance, X was a victim of flooding, could they get the temporary grant, the clothing grant, the school supplies grant, the rental assistance grant, right? Um, and say the household items grant in one fell soup. At this time, 
if the need uh, was determined, then yes. But yes. Yes. Yes, great. And as far as, uh, and, and just to make sure that we've got it, because the submission wasn't clear to us either on that, the clothing grant is per person in the household. Yes. Once clothing was impacted for that particular person and it yes. was identified on the assessment yes. that their clothing was impacted. Right. And if I had 10 children, I could get a 1,000 by 10. But if I have a one child, I'd get a 1,000. Yes, uh, provided that the school supplies were impacted yeah, uh, yes. as determined on the assessment. Okay, um, great, thank you. Now, in terms of uh, what we were told is that after you get the grant, you have 30 days to furnish uh, receipts and invoices to show that the, the money was used for the purpose intended. Is my understanding of that correct? Yes, Chair. Yes. Uh, uh, what is in place to ensure compliance and what is in place to ensure that uh, the bills and receipts that I present are authentic? Thank you, Chair. So as part of the process of someone receiving the grant in question, they are required to sign an agreement. And that, that agreement... Um, is also followed up through the, the checks at the various, um, by the field officers in terms of verifying that the person has utilized uh, the grant for the purpose intended. Um, however, in the context of the volume and being able to, to checks, I, that is an area that the ministry we've discussed in terms of looking at strengthening that component because once someone receives the grant in question, the onus or the, I should say, the impetus to, to get things back um, may, may not always be there. So that's definitely an area so um, because, to be strengthened. Because I was going to say, if you can find me to give me money, having given me money, you can't find me to get receipts. Thank you, oh. Chair. Okay. Thank you. That, that's clear. So... Um, so in terms of your field officers, would I be correct in saying that you're not adequately staffed with that? The answer is yes. And as, uh, as our director, NSDP, indicated, there has been an assessment of sorts and to put forward for some additional staffing to be able to facilitate some of these activities. Uh, so could you tell me and I heard your point that with a disaster, sometimes it's hard to know up front um, what will be sufficient resources, and I take that to also be human resources. But from your experience, and, and, and I'm talking now the historical experience of the ministry and not your personal experience, Mr. Ramchand, because I understand you've made it quite clear to us that you recently, as we would say, just come, right? Um, could you be... Um, tell us what you all would have considered from the assessment to be an adequate, a reasonably adequate strength uh, when it comes to field officers and having determined what is a reasonable adequate strength, what is the variance that currently exists? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would ask uh, the director, NSDP, to speak to the specifics, given that um, they are familiar with, one, what's on the ground in terms of the number of cases per region and the geographic areas to be covered in that regard to be able to provide the necessary service um, to those affected. Sure, thank Thanks. you. I have asked for a total of 21 officers, and I currently have 11. So I've asked for 10 additional. Okay. And um, P.S., what sorts of, where are you in the recruitment process? The, the request uh, put forward has been, uh, is actioned through our HR, and um, the ministry will be following up to provide those resources um, as immediate as possible, given obviously the various checks and balances required in the recruitment of resources accordingly. 
Okay, so I see um, your HR is not here, so we'll ask you in writing to let us know where that recruitment process is and um, how soon you are likely to increase um, um, that number Thank you. of persons. And um, uh, another thing I don't think was answered, but we'll send it to you in writing. In terms, of, I think Member Mitchell asked the point that, you know, how do you verify that I don't have insurance or, or, or that sort of thing? If we could get um, the responses to, to those sorts of questions in writing. And, and maybe this question I could ask to uh, Mrs. DeLeon Henry. In terms of, I, I see with the, I believe it's the household grant where the household items grant, where you have elect, um, utilized an electronic mechanism, which is the steps that was put there, the steps that were put there on page six. The, the household items, and I want to know what was the objective when you all um, instituted this electronic mechanism and whether the objectives have been met if the objectives have not been met, um, what remedial action or actions are proposed? Uh, is it in terms of the electronic mechanism for persons to submit their invoices? F to facilitate the assessment of persons. I, I think that's what the submission says. Okay, so really and truly, the, the, I want to know how effective um, the mechanism has been, this electronic, you said, utilization of electronic mechanism. I don't know what is that, but it's there in the submission. So if I could ask that in writing, you all address um, that to the committee, please. The electronic mechanism, if I may, mm -hmm. I'm just looking for the um, the particular item. Yeah. Chair, if you could just point me to the particular area. So if you look at page five okay. of the submission. Yes, OK. Yes. To process the household items grants, the ministry, the MSDFS, transitioned. So um, if we can know the date of that transition to the utilization of electronic mechanisms to facilitate the assessment of persons desirous of, t of obtaining disaster relief. So th that's what the matter to which I speak. Yes, so okay. in terms of the electronic mechanism, what we are referring to there is the combination of the ArcGIS and also the critical incident portal. Okay. In terms of the information coming in electronically and us being able to move forward from there. Okay. That is what we would have referenced there. So, um, and I, I, I expect that that was done to, to um, shorten the process. Yes. Uh, maybe the answers, the answer to that question has already come forth in um, the discussion. Yes. But I'll still give you an opportunity to answer because I have my own conclusion. I might be wrong. No problem, Chair. Thank you. Member Hislop. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a couple final questions for me. Um, we, we know there are areas in Trinidad and Tobago, primarily Trinidad, that you have this, a perennial problem with flooding. Um, do the same people, if, if affected, or are they able to access the grants? So let's say you're flooded every year and you lose appliances every year. Am I afforded a grant facility every year? Why are you thinking on that? The second one, do businesses qualify for grants, for flood relief grants? And where we know the criteria for the grants is that you must be a citizen. If you only have res if you have a residency status, where where do you where do you sit? 
So the first one is, is every year. Uh, yes, uh, Chair, through, through you, um, I think a similar question was posed earlier, and a, a response uh, would be forthcoming based on the additional information requested. Secondly, with regards to businesses, there's no such access, no such policy that allows for businesses to access um, any of the grants listed or provided by the ministry in question. As far as persons who uh, can access grants, each of those persons must provide their national identification card as part of the process to access the grant in question. Except for the temporary food relief in 2022 when people needed food. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that, that's what I understood, right, Mrs. Guy Hernandez? No, they still were required to, put their, to have the ID card on those lists and sign for them. If I didn't have an ID card, I would not have got any food, temporary food support? Well, once you had some other form of ID, um, that is acceptable. National but, ID? Yes, yes. But for the list um, that we dealt with, those um, individuals would have used the ID cards. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I just want to ask um, Ms. Francis, who's the head of, it and of investigative and compliance unit, in terms of um, any incidents of uh, maybe non-compliance or fraud uh, which may have come to your attention in um, the issue of or processing of grants in 2022, you know, if you could tell us of your experience um, with respect to that. Chair, there were no incidences of fraudulent activity reported to the ICU under the 2022 flood relief grants. Thank you very much. And what about non-compliance? There were no incidences of non-compliance. Okay. My, my colleague would have indicated that there were 57 cases that are still to be investigated and I suspect that some of those cases would come to us. Oh, so, so uh, the investigation doesn't begin with you? No. Okay. Um, so looking at an investigative process, yeah. you look for errors, then fraud, then corruption. Mm -hmm. So some of the investigations that may have to be done by the NSDP unit could identify basic errors that yes, were committed. Yes, yes. They may not they may not come to us. Yes. It is where the activity is of a suspicious nature. It is reported to the ICU and it is there that we do a formal investigation into the incident. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Member Webster Roy. You, Madam Chair. Um, Mrs. Leon Henry, and you had indicated that you requested additional staff and you said you wanted 10, 10 or 11 more. Is it contract, three year contract? What is the status? I would have requested in the first instance because of the urgency if they could be provided on short term as because the contract process takes a little bit longer. But due to the urgency, I, I, the initial request I made was if the persons can come on in short term so that we could get them there faster. And your current team now, they're contracted officers or is it also short term? It's a combination of both. How many you have contract? I have six officers, five officers that are out of contract and uh, six officers that are on short term. So I can turn that.
five officers on contract, six on short term. Okay, and, and just let me ask uh, Deputy PS, just for a little clarification, with the household items grants, um, I see that uh, depending on the item, a maximum sum is allowed. Okay, so I see here like for a stove, regardless of what kind of stove the person lost, what they'll qualify for is $2,500 to replace a stove, yes? Yes, okay. yes madam. So uh, let's say a person lost all of these things, every one of these items here in the flood, they will only get a maximum of $10,000. Yes, Madam Chair. Who determines how that $10,000 is going to be spent? So would the disbursement of the $10,000 come and say, well, for a stove, for a fridge, for a mattress, with a bed and a mattress, which will uh, bring us to the 10000 or you just give me 10000 and then I submit the bills to show what I bought? The, the uh, person would receive the $10,000 as the maximum ceiling if so qualified in the context of their submission. And based on those priorities, they will select um, the appropriate items of need. So it's the applicant who yes. determines yes, how the spend yes, will be allocated. Okay. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. So what I would ask uh, the three PSs here, if they could assist the committee in um, maybe saying what we can do to help you. I certainly heard Ms. Delineon Henry say what we could do to help her. And I certainly heard Mr. David suggest what we could do to help him. But um, certainly I'd like to give an opportunity to Mr. Mitchell Mrs. Guy Hernandez and Mr. Ramchan um, an opportunity to see what we can do to help them. And before I call on them, I'll ask Member Mitchell to ask his last question. You leave it? Okay. All right. Okay. So thank you. So um, uh, let's go first, I'll say ladies first. Thank you, Madam Chair. In order for the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services to better serve our clients, not only when we have um, disasters or flood, but in other areas, what is required is a more collaborative effort across ministries and the corporation. If we are able to achieve that, the time frame within which we respond will be cut down and our efforts will be able to have a more meaningful impact on the persons who are affected by disasters and also those persons who we serve in particular, the vulnerable in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Guy Hernandez. Mr. Ramchan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to echo the sentiments of my colleague, I agree. And my view is that in terms of facilitating a coordinated and integrated approach to disaster response and disaster management is absolutely essential. For example, our ministry would have one remit, but there are other ministries and agencies that can provide meaningful and valuable support to our vulnerable and um, strengthening the coordination and integration of the, the, the approach and the response um, will vitally assist our ministry as well as the other, the other stakeholders uh, that are required to support and provide the necessary resources at that time of need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramchand. Mr. Mr. Peter Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members. I, I just want to endorse 
uh, my colleague, Deputy PSs, we all are what he said just come. I think from the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, as I do it too early in my opening statement, we depend on the regional corporations and other first responders in terms of assisting us at the, at the center in terms of responding very quickly to any form of disaster. It could be flooding in the wet season or bushfires in the dry season or any combination of both. I think in terms of what we are doing in the context of local government reform, we are looking over time to devolve a lot more uh, responsibilities to the regional corporations. And coming to you as, as, a, as a parliament would be the increased um, budgets for these regional corporations that will come over time. I think I want to endorse what DPS Ramcharan had said about it's a joined up government, it's a whole of government activity. And from my understanding, when I came to the ministry, the collaboration with the Ministry of Social Development and Family Service has always been ongoing and very cordial, and in, even in preparing for this um, session today. So I think that is what I would hope. And to, in, to follow on what my colleague, Mr. David, had said, we also wish that members of parliament will also cooperate with the disaster management units at the various regional corporations with the information that is needed. And we will be happy uh, to provide the information to you all in terms of helping us to respond to your constituents in a more uh, effective and efficient manner and so forth. Thank you very much. So I, I want to thank uh, the representatives of both the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services and the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government for this very uh, enlightening discussion with respect to uh, flood relief programs and the distribution of flood relief to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, there are some further questions we have, but they will be sent to you all in writing uh, with a timeline um, so that the committee will be in a position to deliberate further and, and submit its report with recommendations in the hope that we can all collaboratively, that's a word we've used here a lot, um, help each other in doing better for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Again, I thank you. I thank the members of the media. I thank the members of the listening public who stayed with us. I now bring this meeting to an end. I wish you all a safe journey home. Good evening. This meeting is now suspended.